Good afternoon, members. We have a formal quorum, so I call the meeting to order now. Deputy Chairman, please be seated. Item number one on the agenda, confirmation of minutes, is uh, paper number CP bracket 4468-1314. The minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of January have been sent to members. So far, we haven't received any proposed amendments. So, members, can we confirm the minutes here and now? If there's no objection, all right. So, confirm minutes confirmed. And information papers issued since the last meeting. There are two, which are listed on the agenda. And number three. CB bracket four four six nine stroke thirteen to fourteen. Uh, there are two appendixes. The next meeting will be held on the fourteenth uh, of April uh, at uh, four thirty p.m. We are going to discuss four items. First, increasing the financial support to tertiary education. And uh, the, there's a briefing by the administration in relation to the uh, 2014 uh, policy address, and uh, the administration is also planning to submit a uh, funding application to the finance committee in May. And also, uh, we are, want to discuss uh, improving the, the teaching of Chinese education for non-Chinese speaking ethnic uh, minority students. This is uh, number eight on the list of uh, outstanding issues. And uh, the government is going to brief us on the uh, 2014 policy rela address related initiative to help uh, non Chinese speaking ethnic minorities to learn Chinese as a second language. And uh, there's also another uh, item on uh, spe uh, special school inside uh, 5C of uh, Kai Tech. And also, a, uh, and for that project, uh, a submission will be made to the PWSC in May, and and fourthly, we we are going to discuss a, a social development school for girls in uh, Choi Hing Ro Kun Tong. Again, uh, they are going to submit a submission to PWSC in May. So, in view of the uh, discussion items, uh, altogether four, may I invite uh, members to the agree to extend the meeting time to seven. PM because normally I can only extend the meeting by fifteen minutes only. So may if with your consent I would like to have uh, the meeting time extended to seven PM for the next meeting. All right. And uh, then here's a reminder in accordance with rule uh, eighty three A of our rules of procedure, if a member has a direct or indirect peculiar interest in respect of any discussion items to to in today's uh, meeting, please discard the interest before you speak. When you talk about the list of uh, our, uh, items to be discussed at the next meeting, well, I I I agree. We would uh, have a meeting that would last uh, up to seven p.m. and on the twenty fifth and the, of February and the thirteenth of uh, March, I wrote to you the, concerning the provision of fifteen years of free and universal education, and while, and some parents have asked us to set up a special uh, a subcommittee, and the panel uh, is uh, requested to the. Arrange a public hearing so as so that we can monitor the progress. Well, I received your letters, and the deputy chairman has also written to me to set up a subcommittee under the panel to follow up uh, this uh, subject uh, about uh, the 15 years of free and universal education. And I've also received uh, letters from deputations expressing similar views. Uh, today we have uh, two major issues. One about post-secondary education sector, and the other about our secondary schools. For the next meeting, uh, I I have to invite the members to give consent to uh, 
have a meeting that will last until 7 p.m. so that we can have time to discuss the matter you have just raised. As regards to a public hearing, uh, back in 2013, we, held, we, we had two public hearings on the 19th and 26th of March, and more than 130 deputations came to express their views. Maybe uh, we can uh, discuss this uh, idea of uh, arranging for more public hearings at the next meeting. Uh, maybe we can also talk about uh, the, uh, the schedule and uh, timing. Uh, Chairman, are you going to discuss the uh, proposal to set up a subcommittee at the next meeting? Yes. All right, we move on to the next item, issues related to governance and re regulation of self-financing post secondary education sector. Please refer to paper CP4469131401. Please ask the deputations to come in. Who would like to speak on this uh, item? Please raise your hands so that uh, we can jot down your names and uh, save some time. Hands steady, please. Uh, even if you raise both hands, you can only speak once. Viking, you Viking. Yip Kin Yuan, Ma Fong Kok, Yamo. Ah, Ka Lok, Ka Lok, Ha. Ah, Him Ko, Him Ko. Uh, I'll say this when they have all come in and receive it. Please be seated. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome the representatives from the administration and uh, deputations for attending today's meeting. We are now on the item uh, entitled "Issues Related to the Governance and Regulation of the Self-Financing Post-Secondary Education Sector." Please wear the earpiece and choose the channel you need. Channel zero is floor. Channel one, Cantonese. Channel two, English. Uh, we have uh, received, uh, we have uh, today in attendance 23 deputations and individuals, and the relevant submissions have been uh, referred to members and the administration. I would like to remind the deputations and individuals attending this part of the meeting your written submissions and oral the representations made here are not protected by the Legislative Council powers and privileges or ordinance. And also, it's not the job of the panel to in deal with individual cases. So our discussion should only be about the uh, sector's uh, governance and, and rather than uh, the uh, way the different uh, institutions are operated. I invite the Secretary for Education to give an introduction, and then I'll ask the deputations to speak. Each. Uh, Yes, uh, will be given three minutes to speak. When the uh, time is up, I'll ask you to stop. So please be succinct in your uh, speech. If you want to supplement, uh, you're welcome to do so in writing. Secretary, for an introduction, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to welcome everyone. 
I have already provided a paper and I won't repeat the contents. Uh, maybe I can uh, highlight a few important points here. Uh, first, is the government policy to support uh, the uh, development of publicly funded and self-financing self post-secondary education sectors? Because the self-financing sector can uh, respond uh, very flexibly to uh, di different needs uh, in the community and to provide uh, different sorts of program for the uh, students. And it's uh, very important that we have this uh, independent sector to train our talents. We respect the autonomy of our uh, higher education institutions. And since uh, they are running self-financing pro uh, programs without any recurrent subvention, uh, we only look at uh, the uh, operation of such uh, programs uh, on the principles of reasonableness and proportionality. We place our focus on uh, quality assurance, uh, good governance, and uh, safeguarding the interests of students. And I have to stress that we do not just rely on laws to um, make sure that uh, the, the sector is uh, properly governed. We have also introduced um, administrative measures to ensure quality and to ensure transparency and effectiveness. We we we, res we respect uh, the quality assurance mechanism that we have put in place. So apart from the uh, current mechanism, we have also the joint uh, quality assurance mechanism, the Joint Quality Review Committee, and other measures to ensure quality. We have also uh, responded to the uh, report on higher education. We agree that there should be external uh, scrutiny and quality assurance for the associate degree programs run by higher education institutions uh, which are on a self-financing basis so as to ensure consistency and uh, quality. And therefore, we have set up this uh, committee uh, on uh, planning and uh, implementing the uh, quality assurance monitoring system. And also the Committee on Self-Financing Post-Secondary Education has uh, commissioned uh, a consultant to review the situation and um, refer to overseas experience so as to the come up with good practice. We believe that the study can be uh, believed in, in the middle of this year and we would announce the findings so that we can uh, come up with a more developed uh, monitoring measures. As for support for students, in the past few years we have made a, a lot of improvements to lessen their financial burden. Uh, all in all, these, these are self-financing uh, programs vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, publicly funded uh, programs are on a par in terms of uh, sub, uh, sub assistance, financial assistance. and uh, Students on the self-financing programs are eligible for various allowances, and we also uh, encourage the provision of bursaries and uh, uh, and scholarships. And uh, I'm here uh, today to listen to views from all our deputations. Now I invite the deputations and individuals to speak. The first speaker will be Dr. Teddy So. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman members and officials. In response to Mr. Ng's remarks, I'd like to ask a question. I'm very pleased to see a fund for distributing scholarships to higher education students, and our students did receive some of the scholarships. However, this year some of the details have been changed favoring the four-year programs. Students are to provide academic results for the past two years, but our full-time associate degree students only have two-year programs. So how can they do so? And latest by December, they have to submit their results, but our students have not yet completed all the exams. So this year, none of our students was able to apply for 
the scholarships. So I'd like you to take note of that. Secondly, concerning QESS, Quality Education Support Scheme is actually very good. Every college and institution can apply. However, we're unable to grasp the criteria. Some of our colleagues taught for 10 years in the UK. They use their research grant projects in the UK for application but failed. I don't understand where the problems lie. Is it a quality problem? We don't mind writing proposals, but we'd like to have clearer subvention guidelines. Thirdly, as the Secretary for Education mentioned, the review report mentioned the framework for quality assurance. That has been discussed for a few years. I'd like to know whether there's any latest progress for our reference. For us, uh, we really feel that our hands are tied. There's another point. The whole sector or all the self-financing institutions don't have a, a concerted platform for us to participate in and to speak. We're adopting the old approach of using 500 students as the criterion for membership. Therefore, new institutions have been included from that league. Last year, there's this scenario. The, they're excluded and under the league were being monitored. That's not fair. Throughout the whole process, we did not take part in the discussion. We were not members, we were excluded, but then we were monitored by them. Next speaker, Professor Edwin Wong. Good afternoon. I'm the president of the Hong Kong Buddhist College, Edwin Wong. I'd like to mention some of my personal views. I very much want the administration to greatly support the development of higher education institutions. Each of their ins these institutions have their own ideals and vision. They provide diversified education to our students. I hope that the government can ensure that Hong Kong has good and fair education environment and policies and to provide reasonable support to these institutions. As regards the term university, I hope that it is a term to recognize the standard of our institutions. So don't be too harsh in the use of the term. Under CAP 320, if an institution is registered and like to be called a university, I hope that the application process can be shortened to five years instead of going beyond 10 years or 10 years. Secondly, the government should make it very clear for the HKCAVVQ for the accreditation of sub-degree programs, the criteria should be the same as those for subventor degrees for recognized standards. In order to strengthen this point for the private institutions, there should be a fix rate subvention for the students. At present, the framework is polarized. Either you have a subsidy or not. I think there should be something in between so as to resolve misunderstandings. For example, a subsidy of $20,000 per student will be able to attain that goal. Resources used to support students going overseas to study should be plowed back to local institutions in order to boost students' confidence in staying in Hong Kong to further their studies. Finally, from the angle of fairness, the new Yijin Diploma Program subvented by the government should be able to be operated by any institution accredited by the HKCAAVQ so as to provide a more diversified range of choices to our students. 
or equal assistance should be provided to similar programs. Thank you, Chairman. Next, Professor Peter Yun. Good afternoon, Chairman and members. According to the experience of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, we're of the view that quality assurance and regulatory regime for self-financing post-secondary institutions are already very complicated and strict, including external and internal accreditation with HKCA, AVQ and JQRC saying the same after their accreditation work. They even suggest a more lenient approach. So the remarks that were substandard are not reasonable. Recently, I conducted a systematic comparison and benchmarking comparisons between Hong Kong and the USA. Our teachers' qualifications are higher than those of the community colleges in the USA. For us, 40% of our students possess university degrees. In the US, it's only 20%. Our student enrollment criteria are more stringent, much more stringent than theirs. And the rate of furthering their studies is also higher than theirs. For my college, is as high as 80%. But the community colleges in the U.S. are greatly subvented by the government, all the way up to 80%. But here in Hong Kong, is zero. The community colleges of the U.S. have a history of 100 years, but we have very short history, so it's not simple for us. As for associate programs for entering UGC-funded institutions and students entering universities by way of JUPAS results, according to the data for four years, for the sub-degree students, they don't have uh, very marked differences from their counterparts from the JUPAS. According to our employer surveys, most employers are satisfied with the performance of sub-degree students. Not very much different from the rate of support for the other degree students. Therefore, criticisms that our students are Low and standard are unfair, unreasonable to the students and the institutions. With no assistance from the government, we've been providing thousands and tens of thousands of places to our students. It's very unfair to us. Dr. Joy Shi, Mr. Chairman, members, I'm the president of the Hong Kong Institute of Technology. First of all, I'm very grateful for your concern. We support one single subvention system for us. If we are to provide a fair protection to our students, we need just one subvention system with openness, consistency, and transparency. We emphasize very much consistency and fairness. Our institute has been accredited for at least 30 times. We're not afraid of the panelists, but we are very concerned about some of our rivals sitting on the panel. So we'll never be able to attain the goals. I think many of our colleagues have heard this remark. So we need clear, detailed, consistent regulatory regimes with the same standard. As for CAP 3 to 0, I understand that co members would like to enhance institutional and student participation in the regime. But is it really a very effective approach to set up one single accreditation body? Because the institution's governance will be affected by the accreditation. There may be individual criteria and individual institutions can attain their goals at different stages. So we'll be able to attain our goal instead of rewriting CAP 320, which is already outdated. Well, let me turn to quality, but which is not directly related to quality assurance in CAP 320. For so many years, 
were non-profit making and we've insisted on our ideals. For the first round of our Yijin program, we ranked first in Hong Kong in terms of the number of students. I begged a student for 30 minutes. He begged me for 30 hours because I begged him to leave and he begged to stay because he's blind. And in our classes, there are other students with disabilities, with other degrees of impairment. There should be 30 or students per class. The tuition fee collected less than $1 million. If we deduct teachers' costs, we can hardly make our ends mean, meet. For that blind student, he studied very well in our associate degree program. Should we exclude him? I hope that you can open your eyes wide and look at the problems, and these students will be very grateful to you. Next, Professor Danny Wong Shek Nam. Good afternoon. I'm from the university. Just now, the secretary said that on many fronts, in terms of action and finance, the government has been supporting self financing institutions. As a member of the sector, I'm very grateful. However, Hong Kong's education is not just to provide a good learning environment to the students. We should also provide extracurricular activities to our students, particularly hostel life. Hostel life can allow students to learn how to live with people, how to have mutual accommodation in accommodating others' differences with them, and so forth. At the moment, only a couple of self-financing institutions have their own land sites. The remaining cannot provide hostel places. There's no place and not sufficient money to build hostels. Therefore, I hope that the government can consider building hostels shared by the self-financing institutions. And these institutions should be allowed to distribute their hostel places on their own. So these hostels uh, can be places where uh, our students can interact with uh, our own students as well as students from other uh, institutions since these uh, hostels are going to be shared. We also admit uh, mainland uh, students and uh, they, bring, they bring positive uh, effect on our students. But if we don't have any uh, Thing like hostels uh, for uh, more uh, close uh, in interaction between the different groups of students, the benefit will be l lower than what it would have been. I think uh, if we provide hostels to th th these uh, different groups of the students, the benefit can be very, very good. The hostels can be operated either by the government or by some uh, NGOs. And uh, th I believe that they can be operated on a self-financing basis, uh, apart from the uh, capital cost. Uh, Dr. David Mole. Uh, I'm uh, David Mole. I'm the Associate Provost at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, my university uh, doesn't sponsor uh, a community college or other uh, sub-degree uh, institution or, or, or run programs of, it, of its own. Uh, but we do articulate uh, quite a large number of graduates from uh, those colleges, about 200 a year, and we hope over time to um, articulate more. Um, uh, and uh, we have uh, been working quite hard to set up uh, appropriate uh, capacity for our artic smoothly articulating uh, those students. Um, our experience has been uh, that students that we bring in from the sub-degree sector do very well with us. They do well with us academically, uh, and they also uh, bring uh, a different spirit uh, to the university. Uh, uh, they have uh, uh, suffered already some check and have overcome that and have done well in their programs in the uh, community college sector. Uh, and that, that brings a, a level of motivation and um, seriousness which is uh, bracing for uh, our other more fortunate students. Um, 
I uh, think that it's important to say at a meeting like this uh, that uh, Hong Kong is fortunate uh, to have been building and have built uh, such a um, valuable uh, sub-degree sector. Uh, I think that uh, compared with international comparisons that for a, a number of historic reasons uh, uh, that such a sector has emerged, I think in part that's uh, been the outcome of the fact that it's been broadly speaking sponsored by uh, established universities which their own sense of academic quality uh, and uh, their own uh, sense of mission and uh, desire to maintain uh, the standard of, of, of work and that's really uh, been good for the uh, community as it sought to expand the tertiary sector. Uh, I think uh, having said that uh, it's Im important although of course uh, nothing's perfect and there's room for improvement that uh, the balance should be to value and to nurture uh, this sector uh, uh, as far as possible going forward uh, to give it support uh, to um, recognize what it's doing for Hong Kong and for Hong Kong's young people uh, and uh, uh, to um, uh, move it forward to, uh, um, uh, over, over time. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Chen Chok Hei. Thank you, Chairman. I'm representing the Hong Kong College of Technology. Uh, today, we're talking about the, uh, the governance and regulation of the uh, self financing post secondary education sector. I've been working in this sector for some time already uh, in discussing this subject. We have to uh, cover a few aspects which has to do with the uh, environment in which the uh, sector uh, operates. First is as the government says in the paper, uh, in terms of law, we have uh, four types of uh, institutions. Some uh, are set up uh, by uh, law, by its own uh, ordinance, mostly UGC funded institutions, and then we have uh, the open university, and then there are those who are set up under CAP 3 uh, 2.0, and then there, there's a fourth type, those set up under the education ordinance, and then there are those who are set up under the uh, CAP 493, the local post-secondary institutions. The second aspect is that uh, we have to look at the uh, the way the quality assurance is done or whether they have the power to self-accredit their own programs. Uh, first, there are universities with uh, self-accreditation power. Second, uh, they can uh, do, do self-accreditation in respect of certain uh, disciplines on programs. And then uh, there are institutions that have to be accredited program by program. And then uh, there are the fourth type which can operate a local uh, programs without accreditation. And then we can also uh, divide them into three t uh, types, uh, financially speaking. Uh, first, uh, uh, no, uh, self-financing institutions, or oh, no, rather publicly funded uh, institutions such as UGC funded institutions and the VTC. And the second, uh, independent uh, institutions. And then there are also institutions which are, are run uh, like uh, commercial entities. So the environment is complicated since they can be uh, categorized in so many ways. Uh, for individual in institutions, uh, th 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 their background can be very complicated. And we cannot just look at this uh, from the perspective of CAP uh, 320. Uh, different institutions face uh, different uh, regulatory requirements and they enjoy different powers and privileges. Some are disadvantaged and they are treated uh, I would say unfairly. I hope members uh, in discussing this subject can uh, clarify first of all where the problems arise and don't generalize the self-financing sector as one sector and nothing else. And when you uh, make a decision, members, please uh, uh, consider all the factors that I have just referred to. Uh, Professor C.F. Lee. Uh, well, I'm from uh, space of uh, the University of Hong Kong. I want to share a couple of points here with uh, you. First, the UGC University, the vice chancellors and the presidents, and uh, the 
Hong Kong CAA VQ uh, have set up a tripartite committee to uh, make some uh, recommendations on the uh, policies regarding the uh, regulation of self-financing programs. Edu the Education Bureau will send observers to the uh, committee. The three members of the committee uh, have uh, extensive, certainly uh, extensive experience on quality assurance. As a member of the uh, committee, I have uh, confidence that uh, the committee will be up to its uh, task. As regards whether, what factors should be considered in uh, changing the regulation of the self-financing post-secondary sector, well, the law we have has been around for 60 years. Of course, uh, uh, the, the, the community has it has changed, and we need to make uh, changes to the law correspondingly. In Hong Kong, uh, it's difficult to uh, operate. Uh, a uh, tertiary education institution in Hong Kong is difficult. I look at how th what the difficulties faced by Ms. Uh, Dr. Chong Ki Wang uh, in running the private uh, Suyan University. In, uh, the, in Japan, in Korea, South Korea, 70 or 80 percent of the uh, secondary students pro progress to universities. And um, among the universities, we have private universities. But there are new private universities also get uh, assistance from the government on a per uh, per capita basis. And in the U.S., even uh, uh, Stanford universities and other private universities uh, get uh, large amounts of uh, financial assistance from the government. I hope uh, in changing the uh, applying law for private institutions, we would uh, make reference to the uh, good uh, experience uh, in other advanced countries. Uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members, uh, SCAD Hong Kong is grateful for the privilege of addressing the panel on education, commends the panel for its commitment to quality assurance and to establishing Hong Kong as a regional hub for education. In our submission, we make several key points which I'd like to reiterate at this time. Point one, SCAD Hong Kong endorses the implementation of a single quality assurance body that creates and promotes a level playing field for all of Hong Kong's locally accredited post-secondary programs, whether local or non-local publicly funded or self-financing. Point two, Hong Kong's current quality assurance system results in a separate and unequal treatment of locally accredited non-local post-secondary programs to the detriment of local students and Hong Kong's ability to become a regional education hub. Consider the recent technical refinements of measures in relation to Hong Kong's development as a regional hub that in fact prohibit non-local students enrolled in full-time and in locally accredited non-local programs from participating in part-time on-campus employment. While so, no such restriction is placed on non-local students enrolled in full-time locally accredited local programs. We are concerned that this restriction will adversely affect local students' access to important student support services. For example, at SCAD Hong Kong, all students are eligible to receive individualized assistance from peer tutors in a variety of areas, ranging from specialized equipment, computer software usage, to English language proficiency. Currently, the best qualified local non-local student work as our peer tutors. The new restriction would limit the pool of eligible candidates for these positions. With local students comprising 60.1% of our total enrollment, it would be local students who will be disproportionately affected. Point three, any contemplated single quality assurance body for Hong Kong should ensure that its policies and regulations accord equal treatment to all locally accredited post-secondary programs in all material aspects and particularly concerning the following their ability to recruit and admit qualified students regardless of the student's home country, including mainland China, the forms of government resources and financial assistance available to the programs and their students, and finally, the immigration and employment rights and privileges of the program's students and the graduates. We would also like to see compliance with local quality assurance standards. Since opening in 2010, SCAD has consistently met and exceeded the stringent quality assurances. 
enrollment of financial of and financial support for local students. SCAD Hong Kong is committed to providing local students with excellent education opportunities as demonstrated by our enrollment of over 315 undergraduate and postgraduate students who collectively comprise 60.1 percent. Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, Mr. Moroy. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for this opportunity today. My name is Dan Malloy from Kaplan Business and Accounting School, Kaplan Hong Kong. I'd like to touch on three points related to the governance regulation of the self-financing post-secondary sector. Uh, my first point today being uh, related to the JQRC report on 2012-13 higher diplomas, associate diploma over-enrollment over of uh, JQRC member institutions. According to the report, it remarked that in the face of the larger demand, some SSPUs decided to change their plans and enroll over the planned, initial planned intake. It seemed to be a responsible act to admit more DSC students who met the requirements for associate diploma and higher diplomas. However, the above explanation was not convincing owing to the fact that many smaller private self-financed institutions failed to admit enough students in the double cohort year as a consequence. Several private institutions admitted only between 10 and 15 students. In the same report, JQRC found that there had occurred a time lag between the admission of students and the completion of the planned resources in the case of individual SSPUs. This had undoubtedly led to unsatisfactory provision of space and resources for some students at the start of the academic year. Unfortunately, the rights of, to knowledge of many students have been jeopardized. Lingnan Community College is a case in point and this, we think, is a fundamental quality assurance oversight that should not have occurred. Moreover, some of the programs on offer have not yet been fully approved by JQRC at the time of admission. If we look at the practice of HQC AAVQ program validation, institutions have to show in advance that there are adequate classroom facilities and seats for the proposed students' numbers before the program would be approved. Would it be fairer for all self-financed institutions in Hong Kong to follow the same rule in quality assurance matters? We would suggest that an overall student number allocation policy similar to the one practiced by UGC for all UGC funded institutions would be ideal. If the government needs to subsidize each UGC funded student 200,000 Hong Kong dollars annually, would it be possible for a self-funded com community colleges to provide quality education with tuition income? We need urgently a single regulatory body to oversee all the self-financed subdegree programs. This is the best way to promote the healthy development and maturity of the self-financed sector. Point two, in response to the above incidents, the government recently set up a platform naming the concourse for secondary post, um, excuse me, self-financing post-secondary education and the Liaison Committee on Quality Assurance. The goals of the Liaison Committee A is to promote the sharing of good practices among all the quality assurance bodies and B to conduct periodic external audits to review on private community colleges under the aegis of UGC funded institutions. This is a good start, however we feel there is more to properly regulate the present situation that can be done. The self-financed education in Hong Kong has not even been fully supported fully by parents, students, empl employees. It is the right time to revamp the present structure. Thank you. Okay, in Hako Ma Ji Kyung Bossi. Next, Dr. Louis Ma. Uh, representing uh, City University of Hong Kong uh, School of Continuing and Professional Education. I, I would like to raise a point regarding the enriching um, students' learning experience and employability, uh, with specific reference to uh, students' uh, participation in non-local exchange programs and non-local placement programs. I think uh, the uh, additional uh, concern and funding uh, from QESS will, will be beneficial to our students. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Sam Lau from Hong Kong Baptist University. Secondary education opportunities for youngsters on a self-financing basis during the past decade. Such policy has proven to be an important powerhouse to reduce the needed human resources for Hong Kong knowledge-based economy. The government is urgently requested to tighten quality control, the lack of common standards for regulating institutions, and the lack of comprehensive long-term commitments by the government to the development of this sector 
have raised community-wide concern about the discrepancy in the quality of programs and graduates amongst different institutions. Thus, the government is urged to consider the following recommendation, both at the system and at the funding level, to ensure the quality and value of self-financing post-secondary education provided. Firstly, common standards for regulating two-year and four-year self-financing post-secondary education institution. Statistics from HKBU self-financing post-secondary education provision show that more than 75% of associate degree graduates further their undergraduate studies each year locally or overseas, while the remaining join the workforce Tertiary-wide statistics also confirm the, ve the very positive prospect of graduates of self-financing post-secondary programs for further studies or work. While expanding the post-secondary education, emphasis must be placed on quality of programs and graduates rather than quantity so that graduates are well equipped equip for the workplace and for further studies. Guidelines on both hardware and software standards need to be clearly set for institution, for quality education and whole person education. On the hardware side, the facilities requirements should include the average minimum physical space for a per student and staff to determine the maximum student capacity allowed including um, facilities for teaching, learning, library, IT, sports, and student development. On the software side, requirement and standard for two-year and four-year program institution like number of full-time teaching staff, number of full-time guiding counselor, staff development resources should be well established and monitored. Secondly, healthy development of self-financing post-secondary education. The government has to provide financial support if tuition fees of self-financing post-secondary education are to be set at a reasonable and affordable level. The government should provide more than land grant and interest fee loan to institution, but also look at ideas like student vouchers with sufficient direct financial subsidies. Thank you. 好,下一位是鄭慧雲博士。Next. Mr. Chairman, I'm from the Tonghua College, Professor Sylvia Fung. We provide practical programs for the governance of self-financing institutions. There should be two tiers. That is the territory-wide aspect and the institutional aspect. In terms of hardware and software, the government should enhance its role. CAP 320 provides that Tonghua College and other sub-degree institutions should be regulated under a certain regulatory system and framework. We support the amendment of the ordinance. We hope that the amended ordinance will be more updated so that less restrictions will be imposed on the institutions. At the same time, we should all the more protect the quality of the institutions. And there should be an information platform across all the institutions. And this avenue can be used to compare the standards and quality of institutions. Among institutions, if they can share their experience and adopt a uniform set of quality assurance standards, it will enhance accountability and accreditation. We have to cope with the ever-changing economic environment of the world. And the leadership composition of the institution should be retained. And we should be able to employ quality professionals to disseminate their knowledge and skills to our students. Besides, autonomy of Academic development is very important in terms of enrollment, criteria of, envir of enrollment, and so forth. We should like to have an independent quality assurance body with financial independence as well. That is to guard against uh, a confusion between the monitor and the financial provider. Quality assurance uh, is an indication of accreditation and accountability. So, all such institutions should be provided with a set of guidelines. 
Tsinghua College agrees that should, there should be a uniform set of clearly defined quality assurance mechanisms, so as to safeguard the quality of the higher education sector of Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, we always have academic autonomy. Therefore, good governance and good regulatory regimes are very important both to the institutions and our students. Next, Dr. Catherine Eppe. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine from the HKC AAVQ. We're an independent statutory body set up under the Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications Ordinance. Our main function is to accreditate programs run by the self-financing institutions. We're composed of local and non-local members with quality assurance, training, and educational professionals and experts. And when we do accreditation, we'll take reference from local and overseas standards. We'll also employ experts to be members of our panelists. At the moment, we've commissioned around 900 experts. A quarter of them are non-locals. They are the experts in their respective professional area. In terms of quality assurance, institutional management, educational management, curriculum management, and so forth, they're very experienced. We all agree that quality assurance is very important to keep the standard of the self-financing high high education institutions. Therefore, we have four phases of quality assurance for the institutions and their programs. These four stages are initial assessment, uh, curriculum assessment, uh, assessment of individual subjects, and regular reviews. For those who would like to apply for registration under CAP320, we also accreditate them. We follow the academic requirements under CAP320 as well as the relevant regulations under CAP 320A. When the relevant panel conducts accreditation, it will look at uh, that institution to see whether it can run degree programs to attain level five of the qualifications framework. It will also accreditate the governance, management, and relevant compositions of the institutions. Finally, we agree that community colleges, self-financed degree programs should be subject to regular external accreditation so as to enhance quality. For that purpose, our council has set up a relevant working group to prepare for the execution of the details. Thank you. Next, Ms. Andrew Hope. As Hong Kong's first and thus far only private university regulated under CAP 320, Xu Yan is grateful for the opportunity to support the technical amendments proposed by the administration last year. Xu Yan was granted university title by the chief executive in 2006 after having undergone a rigorous institutional review process. It should be noted that the rigor of the process and the time taken to complete it are such that to date no other self-financing institution has been able to fulfill all the requirements for the award of university title. Self-financing post-secondary institutions registered under CAP 320 can never become self-accrediting. This means that we must undergo a thorough, thoroughgoing evidence-based external review by the HKCAVQ of all aspects of the institution every five years in order to confirm continuation of our program area accreditation status. Under the terms of that status, we must seek HKCAVQ accreditation for every single new taught master's program that we wish to offer. The entire process from developing a preliminary program proposal to receiving the final accreditation report takes on average 18 months. Under the terms of CAP 320, once the accreditation status of the proposed program can be confirmed by the HKCAVQ, we must make a further submission to the Chief Executive in Council via the EDB to, for approval to offer the program. It is EDB who makes the recommendation to EXCO for program approval. 
and until EXCO approval has been received, we're not allowed to confirm that the program will be offered or to accept applications to it. The problem that arises is that while EXCO usually meets monthly, it has a heavy agenda, and the approval of taught master's programs does not, of course, rate highly in their list of priorities. In a recent case, uh, a request for program approval that we submitted to EDB at the beginning of January this year for consideration at the January EXCO meeting has twice been bumped from the EXCO agenda and was only considered, and I'm pleased to say approved, this morning. As the program was due to launch in June, this setback represents a serious disruption to our planned schedule. If final approval under CAP 320 had been delegated to the Permanent Secretary for Education as proposed last year, this additional delay, which reflects very badly on the institution, would not have occurred. Our competitors in the UGC sector who offer self-financing taught master's programs have no such hurdles to negotiate. The self-financing post-secondary sector, as has been said, is very diverse. CAP 320 applies only to six institutions, all of whom are subject to rigorous external accreditation by the HKCAVQ and oversight by EDB to ensure the quality and relevance of the degree programs we offer. We strongly request that the panel revisit the proposals to amend the ordinance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Chen Mei Quan here with regards to the post-secondary college, colleges ordinance CAP 320, we would like to urge the government to undertake a systematic, comprehensive review of the ordinance to further streamline the procedures, particularly for registration requirement and student admissions, so as to facilitate the healthy growth and development of self-financing post-secondary sector in Hong Kong. The present regulations are, are slow, cumbersome, and somewhat inflexible. Insofar as QA quality assurance is concerned, we fully support the higher education review group's notion that a robust QA system is essential. It can enhance the international competitiveness of the post-secondary education sector in Hong Kong. Regarding the government's recommendation of establishing a single QA body to serve the whole post-secondary system, our view is that the current system in which the QA of the publicly funded institution and the self-financing institution is managed by different agencies work fairly well. This is because they tend to have very different features and hence involve different issues and challenges. The current system of QA which allies different agencies with different types of programs is able to take into account the peculiar and unique features of these programs. However, we are particularly concerned that different regulatory frameworks and QA practices for different categories of institutions may not be conducive to the sustainable development of the self-financing sector. For instance, the self-financing institution without self-accrediting status have to go for HKC AAVQ for program accreditation and validation, which is often a long, tedious, and inflexible process. Because of this, we might not be able to timely respond to the changing demand of the society, which hampering our development and even survival in general. Another important aspect is how to maintain the quality of programs across the sector, given that the QA methodologies currently adopted by different QA agencies are somewhat inconsistent and confusing in nature. The QA methods employed by different agencies could be better integrated to ensure regulatory consistency for different education providers. None of the present QA agencies can do the job well for all parts of the sectors. We support the recommendation of establishing a single oversight body for all post-secondary institutions to coordinate the QA activities personally handled by QAC, JQLC, and HKCAAVQ in order to ensure a better level of consistency in the QA across Hong Kong tertiary education sector. Thank you. That's all my presentation. Thank you. Next, uh, we have uh, Mr. Wong Wai Sam. The Review Committee, JQRC, is an independent external quality assurance body established by the Heads of Universities Committee to provide a quality assurance framework for the self finance sub-degree programs offered by the UGC-funded institutions. Following international models, JQRC conducts reviews of the institutions under its remit in an independent, fair and transparent manner. Firstly, through conducting institutional reviews. Using external peer review panels and site visits, JQRC reviews the institutional and program arrangements and QA processes for self-financed degree programs. 
Second, vetting self-finance subdegree programs for registration on the qualifications register. There are currently three quality assurance bodies overseeing post-secondary education in Hong Kong, the QAC, JQRC, and HKCAVQ. The division of labor among three QA bodies recognizes the difference in maturity of the institutions and the need for different approaches in quality assurance. The audit review model is best used for the self-accrediting institutions with more mature internal QA systems while non-self-accrediting institutions need to obtain approval for their programs through external accreditation. There might be advantages in an integration of the different QA approaches and the model of one QA oversight body in the longer term. However, with the growth of large numbers of private providers, it might be appropriate to maintain the distinction between two types of institutions for the near future. JQRC will work closely with government and other QA bodies and support measures which will contribute towards the quality assurance of the sector, including the impending establishment of a tripartite working group to plan for external orders for the self-financed subdegree operations of UGC institutions. The Heads of Universities Committee is a member of this working group. This initiative would strengthen the external element in the existing oversight of these units, which is being provided currently through JQRC. It also follows the fine tradition of the audit model for the self-accrediting institutions. Self-accreditation is a recognition of the maturity and achievement of an institution, underpinned by the concept of academic autonomy. JQRC has completed the first cycle of institutional review and will conduct the second cycle as and when considered appropriate by the Heads of Universities Committee and in line with other external developments, with endeavors to further improve transparency and accountability in the system. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, next one, Ms. Helen. Uh. I'm here to represent the Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. Um, in principle, the Academy welcomes the introduction of any quality assurance system that has currency and applicability across the post-secondary sector. Um, however, we would like to stress that any re-envisioned system should A, take into consideration the distinctiveness of institutions, the programs they offer, and the pedagogical approaches that are used at the learning and teaching level. Um, B, ensure parity in how quality is assessed and C, strike a balance between having in place a robust QA framework that is universally accepted and also the need for operational streamlining and efficiency. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Eric Ng. Thank you. I'm here representing the uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. On the question of sing setting up a single uh, unified mechanism for cure quality assurance, uh, we, we subscribe to this uh, view. But we have to bear in mind that different institutions, uh, publicly funded or otherwise, have different uh, missions. They may be research universities or they may be teaching institutions, and therefore the uh, uh, criteria to be applied uh, must take that into account. As a UGC-funded institution, CUHK also offers self-financing associate degree programs. We understand, we believe uh, and agree that uh, such programs should be subject to external accreditation. Therefore, we would lend our support to the uh, committee set up by the Secretary of Education uh, with uh, members representing the UGC, uh, Hong Kong CAAVQ, and institutions. We believe uh, such a we can come up with a new uh, approach to uh, take the place of th that under the JQRC, and I believe this will instill a greater level of confidence on the part of the, the community in respect of quality assurance of programs. Next, we have Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Fong Cheng Man. I'm from Hong Kong Baptist University. We have a self-financing programs concern group. In 2013-14, uh, Hong Kong BU uh, increased tuition fees by 19 percent, a big increase. In 2014-15, uh, 
of self-financing programs would uh, see uh, tuition fees uh, uh, increase to the same level of uh, 82,500 per year. In the in the whole process, the uh, the university uh, did not explain how they uh, came up with this uh, tuition level. And uh, it's not just just not affordable for many students, although the government uh, does provide uh, some uh, assistance in terms of loan to students. But uh, it's a cumbersome uh, process. The uh, eligibility criteria are very strict, and many students cannot comply with the uh, uh, criteria. Many have uh, given up uh, because of the very complicated uh, uh, process involved, and now the the government is uh, is insistent on uh, developing the uh, this uh, post secondary sector as a business, and we are the victims. And uh, the government has stressed that uh, the uh, education sector is not one that seeks to uh, reap profits. But uh, the monitoring mechanism is such that uh, tuition fees are not uh, regulated. I think uh, we should start uh, the uh, regulation by looking first of all at tuition fees, and there should be higher transparency. And the government should re relax uh, eligibility criteria for uh, students on self-financial programs so that uh, loans are more accessible to them, so that they can afford the tuition fees and we can uh, complete our studies. And also the government should also show that it's a due responsibility for education. There should be um, more assistance for self-financing programs and for the, the, their students. Uh, the procedures should be streamlined. And also well, we should there, there should be uh, a higher transparency, financial transparency of uh, self-financing programs, and uh, the institution should be asked to give uh, grants and justifications uh, for uh, raise, raising tuition fees. Uh, it should, we should not allow a situation whereby the institutions can just decide whatever tuition fees they would like to charge on their students. And uh, the government should show that it's a due responsibility in uh, regulating the operation of uh, self-financing programs. Next, we have Mr. Lam Ping Sun, student from Students Union of Tonghua College. Our members and uh, secretary, I have a question. On that day, one tenth of uh, the students in my college, one hundred and fifty of them, uh, asked for an audience, but you were not there. You send your under secretary to see us. You, you give us a very a pretty picture. You you would uh, look at the reasonableness of various things. You would uh, set up a joint working group and so on and so forth. I would say uh, I I want to ask whether it's a lack of uh, commitment or is a uh, a lack of uh, capacity to regulate uh, these uh, self financing programs. We've raised our problems with the media and we 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 have uh, launched our. Uh, Make launch our complaints time and again. And where are you? Where were you? I wonder whether you are really able to help us by invoking the law. The law is outdated, and you are always saying that uh, the, these institutions uh, should be uh, should enjoy autonomy. But I think that Tonghua Group, Tonghua College, is just the first case. Uh, there are more. If we allow things to Develop the uh, life like 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 now. We should uh, try to improve, do our part to improve the tertiary sector. When we want to lodge a complaint, uh, we don't know where to turn to. Uh, we can go to the highest level of uh, the uh, college, but no further. So where can we, if we want help, where where can we get it? For example, I was threatened with uh, expulsion. Where can I t turn to for help? Can anyone help me? N nothing uh, so far. Uh, the 
ordinance was enacted uh, decades ago. Why hasn't it been uh, amended to keep up with present day requirements? We see no transparency. How can the college develop with no transparency? Like the teaching staff, the students should uh, be able to participate as stakeholders. Next, we have uh, Dr. Feng Wai Wa from Hong Kong PTU. Well, in the past 10 years, in terms of student population of uh, self financing programs, there's been an inc a ninefold increase. And uh, the number exceeds uh, those uh, under the funded programs. And uh, we haven't seen any strengthening of monitoring. Instead, uh, the contrary is true. The monitoring has been weakened. Every year, we have heard problems about the self-financing program, scandals indeed. There was over-enrollment last year. Not just one institution did it. Many institutions did it. We are not sure whether uh, well, I'm sure some of the programs have high quality, as some of other speakers have said. But uh, the uh, quality varies. It's not that the media have been over critical of such programs. There must be problems first before people uh, see you critically. We should not try to avoid facing the problem. The ultimate uh, question is quality and uh, whether the students will be adversely affected. So we cannot avoid the problems. Uh, we think uh, monitoring should be strengthened. This is not sufficient. Uh, the government is always saying that uh, no, there shouldn't be a stringent regulation since it's self-financing. So you regard these as commercial operations. And, and they can do whatever they, they, they like, they can abuse their powers. And Tonghua is recently hit with um, a scandal uh, involving conflict of interest, uh, uh, involving the members of the management. And if we do not uh, deal with this problem properly, students will be affected. And uh, I have this suggestion, that actually this in the 2010 report. 展望香港高等教育體系這個報告書都是建議成立一個獨立的監察機制去統一監管所這些自資課程但現在市民樓梯響到現在都還是研究或者有些工作組我估這個不是我們的建議這個是政府找回來做研究的一個報告的建議我們
institution managers had to be appointed and approved by the CE. There's actually a mixture of representation. There's a wide spectrum of representatives. Originally, this is good. I have served on the committees for self-financing institutions and publicly funded institutions. But I don't want these governing bodies to become so-called interest groups. Otherwise, decisions made by them will be very monopolistic. All those in the education sector understand that we need a wide spectrum of opinion from the professionals, the educationists, etc., etc. We cannot just rely on a small governing body, which would restrict the development of the institution concerned. Well, for quality assurance, we mainly rely on the HKCA AVQ. As we heard just now, we usually have a five-year cycle, and for four-year programs, the review is conducted at the fifth year. So they had to work very, very hard and spend a great deal of time on accreditation. But in the interim, what's happening, nobody knows. If any self-financing institution is to change anybody, nobody knows. So we need monitoring. In the past, we have a quality assurance review. So apart from accreditation, what had happened in the interim, we have to know. At the moment, we have a cap for mainland students and Taiwan students. We should consider relaxing the thresholds. Now, the size of our student population is diminishing, so we need to expand the student population from other jurisdictions. Thank you. So much for deputations and individuals. Thank you very much. Your remarks are very rich, covering governance, management, student interest, and so forth. And individual speakers have asked the Secretary for Education questions. So, Secretary, any initial response to their remarks? Thank you, Chairman. Once again, I'd like to thank the deputations for their invaluable advice. Due to time constraint, I'd like to make three points in response. First of all, I'm very pleased to hear that you are apparently in support of one single quality assurance body as a long-term goal. I think uh, we have a great deal of consensus in this regard, so we'll head towards that direction. The Joint Committee is a good start, and we'll head towards that direction. Quality is our first and foremost priority. At Previous panel meetings and on other occasions, there were concerns expressed about assurance as well as the prospects of students. So that will be a very important aspect for us as a gatekeeper. As for assistance for students, if I may refer to our paper, paragraphs 15 to 20 explain the details, so I won't repeat them. Some people ask whether they're helpful. To certain students, as I mentioned, they can apply for loans and grants. There are different types of assistance to allow them to complete their studies. Another important point is the annual adjustment of tuition fees. I heard the worries of students. I heard that many institutions effected their increases in accordance with the inflation rate. We did discuss with the education sector and the self-financing higher education sector. We were told that it's very difficult to draw direct comparisons because programs are different. They cited the example of healthcare programs which call for equipment and facilities. So it is not easy to draw direct comparisons among different programs. Thirdly, for CAP 320, on the 14th of January 2013, we also came to the panel 
on education meeting. But there are other concerns at that moment, so we did not follow up. I'm pleased to hear just now that the deputations would like us to think along that line in the long run. That is, we'll go back and reconsider CAP 320. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary for Education. Other officials, any supplement? Thank you, Chairman. Very simple, just two points. In their remarks, the deputations were very concerned about the interest of students, particularly in relation to quality. Most deputations were in support of a single quality assurance body, but individual speakers said that that's not necessary, particularly for publicly funded institutions, their self-financed programs should adopt the existing approach. And even for a single quality assurance program or body, deputations would like us to give regard to history. In our education system, one very good aspect is diversity. So if uh, we put everything under one single body, we have to consider that element. All these years, it's not true that we had done nothing. For self-financing institutions, publicly funded institutions, Education Bureau, HKCAVQ, the UGC Funding Committee, form a quadripartite group so that before we have a body for quality assurance, we can still make some progress. So we can see that the government is definitely determined to protect students' interests. As for recurrent support for self-financing institutions, it's not true that the self-financing sector does not receive any assistance from taxpayers. Number one, for those students who need financial support, members will recall that a couple of years ago, quite a comprehensive review were, was conducted. And students in self-financing institutions received loans and grants almost on a par with the students of publicly funded institutions. And in the budget and the policy address, it's mentioned that needy students can get reimbursement for tuition fees under the CCF. And for students with good performances, outstanding performances, we provide scholarships, even at a higher level. And then we have the matching grant, one-off subvention, such as the platform of the Open University, there's an electronic library. So all these will provide encouragement and support to our students. Institutions will enhance their quality as well in terms of programs and their students. Of course, at the moment, we also have uh, study grants for the self-financing institutions to apply for. So in the pursuit for excellence, we understand that all these measures will still not be able to satisfy everybody. But of course, uh, we'll make continuous improvement. Rome is not built in a day. We'll head towards the common goal of uh, pursuit for excellence. All right, it's question time for members. The Secretariat has already marked down the names of those who would like to speak. I'll read out their names before I set the time. Ma Fong Kwok, Ip Kin Yun, Helena Wong, Starry Lee, Kenneth Chan, Ip Kok Him, Regina Ip, Michael Tan, Leung Yu Chong. Any more? Any more who would like to speak? Ip Kok Him and Regina Ip are not in the conference room. In order that each member will have more time, I'll give four minutes to each member, including questions and answers. If there's a second round, we I may not 
give you four minutes. Abraham Sheikh, are you raising your hand? Why did you have to wait till I finished? All right, four minutes also for you. For the other members, I may not accord them four minutes each. Ma Fong Kwok, I've waited for a long time. I have another meeting next door. The first question is that the UGC in 2010 suggested that the government set up a single body for quality assurance. Some deputations spoke on this, some in support, some had reservations. I am in support of this idea. Previously, we discussed feasibility. I would like to know when a decision will be made. Can you draw a conclusion now? The Secretary for Education said that by the middle of this year, they would come out with something. Are you going to make a decision then? And then paragraph 25 of the paper mentions that uh, there would be a theme-based subsidy scheme to subsidize up to 1,000 students per cohort to pursue self-financing undergraduate programs in selected disciplines. Why 1,000? How did you arrive at this number? And how do you determine which programs can meet Hong Kong's manpower needs? And why are you putting forth uh, this idea? If this idea is materialized, how would you take into account requirements for institutions and students? Secretary, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ma. May I answer the first question first? We do understand that direction. Therefore, with different sectors of the community and different organizations, we started to conduct studies. In the early stage, it was quite difficult because there were different requirements from different sectors. The Permanent Secretary mentioned this, and I mentioned this in my introductory remarks. We made a big step forward. That is, a joint committee was set up with representatives from four sectors. That's a big step forward. Each sector may differ in terms of uh, culture, student profile, and so forth. So the four parties were able to come together to discuss. That's the first step. In the long run, we would like to have a uniform mechanism for quality assurance. And just now you mentioned the middle of the year. I mentioned the governance report. We would like to publish a report on that by the middle of this year. And also in assessing what Hong Kong needs uh, in the future, we have to bear in mind things such as uh, the aging population. We may face a lack of uh, manpower for uh, elderly homes. But under the current policy, well, we don't have anything to cater for uh, needs in specific uh, areas. So the, we want to make a start. And for three years, uh, we would uh, uh, set a quota of a thousand students to train people to take up uh, training so that they can work in specific areas. And I have quoted uh, elderly homes uh, as an example. And uh, many self-financing programs are doing well in training up the needed manpower. What are the requirements on the students and uh, institutions in respect of this uh, theme-based subsidy scheme? Well, some institutions are facing the difficulties. And that is, uh, they don't know what kind of enrollment uh, can be uh, achieved uh, uh, the following year. And they would like to get some stability of uh, funding so that we can have some sort of a triennium uh, pr planning. Thank you. We are on uh, issues related to the governance and re regulation of the self-financing post-secondary education sector. Uh, members, when you raise questions, you can put the questions to either the officials or to the deputations. 
Mr. Yip Kyun Hin. Uh, I'm most concerned about paragraph 16 of the government paper. There's only one uh, proposal for the uh, way forward. Members uh, have uh, discussed uh, issues such as uh, amendments to CAP 320 and also regulation, how further regulation of the sector. Mr. Chan Chok Hei was with us, so it was a uh, it was a near miss, so to speak, uh, for Mr. Chan. We are going to face similar problems in the future, and that is uh, the ordinance, the uh, post second on post secondary education, is very very outdated. So, so it was not passed uh, in January last year. So are we going to leave thing leave things as they are? So the question is, when are you going to table the Amendments again in this council. Let's look at uh, Cap three two zero A. Yes, it's governance. Yeah. Um, uh, there must be a ward if there's a hostel f for those who are sick. And the students must be subject to medical checks before they are admitted to a hostel. Nothing like this is is being done. And also, uh, they must give a degree diplomas for every program, and they should not provide training to teachers. These are very outdated and uh, and are not uh, in line with reality. And we have uh, encounter problems such as those faced by Tonghua College. So, are there plans to overhaul the ordinance? And if so, the, when can we see some the progress? I'm going to defer to my permanent secretary. But let me say this: as I've said in early 2013. Uh, there were other things that we took into account, and the discussion was uh, postponed. But uh, we 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 did not uh, postpone everything. The the idea of setting up a joint committee uh, was pursued, and it would be pursued now. Permanent secretary, uh, it's right uh, that. Uh, the ordinance is outdated. Certain provisions are no longer uh, relevant, and that's why last year we proposed uh, amendments. But we had no choice last year to withdraw the amendments. We need to give further thought to how uh, the ordinance should be amended. Actually, starting from. Uh, Paragraph 5, we talk about regulatory frameworks, quality assurance, uh, governance, transparency, and so forth, and so on and so forth. All these issues are centered around the uh, regulation of the self-financing sector. We, while we may agree that we should have a single quality assurance body, but the, not, the Buddhist college said uh, we should not be too strict to the point of being draconian, and some uh, would say that the different uh, institutions uh, have different characteristics. So we have different big groups, UGC-funded institutions, and also non-local programs uh, accredited, non-local programs, and uh, some are non-local accredited. Uh, that's part of our history. So when we want to set up a single uh, Quality assurance body. We must uh, have regard to the uh, the different characteristics. But the first part to handle is the to 
do away with the technical anomalies in the ordinance. But unfortunately, that was not supported、uh, by members last year.、Uh, Dr. Helena Wong, thank you. We've heard from the、uh, deputations and、uh, individuals there are、uh, remarks on、uh, the regulation of the、uh, self-financing for secondary sector. And most of the deputation, as I have heard them,、uh, support the idea of a single quality assurance body. And、uh, the ordinances, including Cap Three Two O, are regarded as、uh, outdated. But there also Cap Two Seven Nine, Cap Four Nine Three, as、uh, some deputations have reminded us that they should also be look look at. So, what's the timetable for the bureau? Uh, yeah, last year we said、uh, we should、uh, take a hard look at it. The UGC report was published in 2010, advocating a single quality assurance body. The bureau is saying that、uh, this will be looked into. So, how long would it take for the study to complete? It seems that we are、uh, going to face a long period of、uh, procrastination. And what about the、uh, outdated、uh, provisions in the law? Can we be given a timetable on the、uh, way forward and the and the timetable? Some deputations have、uh, suggested that we should、uh, have some provisions to regulate the composition of、uh, councils and governing bodies, so that different stakeholders would be represented. As a matter of the、uh, the system, so that、uh, governance is more democratic, transparency is enhanced, accountability is、uh, encouraged. Although we are talking about self-financing、uh, programs, there are direct and indirect、uh, subsidy and and assistance. And、uh, LESCO members have no have very little right to the proposed legislative amendments now, so it's, it falls upon the executive to come up with amendments to the improve governance, to improve quality of teaching and learning of the, of these institutions and these programs. Do you have concrete plans for all these, Secretary? Do you have a concrete timetable? As I have said,、uh, maybe I should uh, repeat uh, in a succinct manner.、Uh, it was unfortunate that we had to、uh, suspend our discussion last year about the、um, uh, amendments, but we did not stop. In, our, in certain aspects,、uh, we have、uh, continued to work. For example, the joint committee and、uh, this discussion has started. And secondly, in terms of financial assistance to students,、uh, in terms of transparency, a、uh, financial transparency, we have、uh, worked out something, and also we have uh, provided the uh, uh, electronic platform for、uh, information accessibility, and、uh, that's also this clear message. Uh, there are problems which are so plain that we can certainly handle those first. This is, of course, a very good observation. We、we'll、consider、uh, handling the、uh, obvious ones first. I don't think we don't have time for a second round. So I'll draw a line for members、uh, who would like to ask questions.、Uh, the next one to speak is Miss Starry Lee. First of all,、uh, I would like to join members in welcoming the deputations, and I also want to show my appreciation for the institutions which have been running self-financing programs because you are working under very tight budgets and uh, and uh, your efforts are appreciated. But there is certainly a, a, a demand on the quality of graduates in the community. And I think、uh, quality is a real issue now. Other stakeholders would assess 
uh, the graduates' uh, competencies in various aspects, language, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not very fair for uh, self-financing programs if we assess graduates uh, along these lines. Because, uh, the, of course, for students, uh, they, are, they would certainly uh, offer publicly funded programs first. But I just want to say that uh, members of the public do have certain expectations and and uh, or about expectations about uh, graduate uh, competencies. So I hope uh, the bureau will take the lead to have a discussion in the uh, tripartite or whatever the joint committee that you have set up. The UGC report has been published for so long, and you are still in the early preparation stage. This is simply not acceptable. We must get some answers next time. And next, uh, uh, on the issue of setting up a single quality assurance body, it seems that uh, at present, anything that has been assessed by the uh, Hong Kong CAAVQ is going to be accepted. Uh, I I I I don't know much about the work of the Hong Kong uh, CAAVQ, but what what how do you compare with other accrediting bodies, uh, say in the uh, U in the US and 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 uh, is accreditation a one-off exercise? Is there any need for re-accreditation? And what about the uh, the assessment of uh, graduates? Do you? Also assess the uh, competencies of uh, graduates in various aspects because uh, the, how graduates uh, perform is certainly part of the uh, picture on uh, quality. I don't think they can answer your three questions. That there's just no simply no time. Who should answer your question? The bureau or the Hong Kong CAA VQ? All right, Doctor Yip. Uh, please speak into the mic. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your questions. Uh, there are three questions. Uh, let me uh, briefly respond to those questions. We are a local uh, quality assurance body, a light uh, sister organizations elsewhere. We have signed memorandum of understanding. There are uh, regular exchanges. We learn from each other, and we also adopt uh, the best uh, accreditation practices. We take into account uh, recent developments in uh, institutions. We exchange information, and the uh, and we do not just accredit other organizations. We also get other QA bodies from other countries to accredit us. We have uh, in involved in Kwai He, a body responsible for uh, assessing the higher education institutions. And where are we now? We have uh, conducted a self-assessment within the uh, council. We are writing up submissions, and uh, next year they will come to Hong Kong for uh, on-site inspection. And uh, is it that uh, after accreditation, uh, the programs will no longer be monitored? Well, there is continuous monitoring. If uh, some of the prerequisites uh, have to be met within a certain time frame, we make sure that those institutions uh, comply with it. Dr. Ip, thank you. Well, I have uh, to declare that uh, I am on the board of governors of uh, the Hong Kong UST. Good afternoon. I'm an associate professor from the Baptist University. As a routine, I have to make a simple declaration. Although I don't see any conflict in roles or interests, still I have to make a declaration. Well, we have associate degree programs, and I had been a student of such a program. So I'm a beneficiary as well. Now we're facing a harsh reality. That is, our graduates do face a lot of worries, and we need to be very careful 
with these worries. I've never seen any case in which enrollment solely depended on the academic results. As for GPA average, the average for the students enrolled was actually at a very, very high level. So the graduates enjoy a competitive edge in entering mainstream universities. And Mr. Chairman, that's precisely why for so many years we've been saying that quality assurance is very important. So for the deputations here were fair, we would like to allay your worries so that you don't need to work so hard under harsh conditions. As for the consultancy study, the Secretary for Education said that a report would be released by the middle of this year. Some of our colleagues asked about the timetable. Now, after the publication of the report, what breakthrough would you expect? Would you uphold the existing mechanism or the government is only addressing social expectations by commissioning such a consult consultancy study and upon the publication of the report, no more would come forth? Secretary for Education, may I defer to the Deputy Secretary? The consultancy report mentioned in the paper is about governance and quality assurance. We're now in the final stage. We'd like to complete it by the middle of this year. As for the report, we would like it to recommend a code of practice on good governance such that self-financing high uh, degree institutions would adopt them. Governance principles would be formulated. For example, in the governing team, more induction training might have to be provided. Quality assurance with the basic elements would be set out in guidelines. So we would like to have something down to the earth. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's a bit different from code of practice. A long-term goal is to have a mechanism for quality assurance. Just now we heard that the deputations here had consensus as well as different views. So we would like to have a mechanism of diversity and unity and unity in diversity. So I can't see how that report could be a hindrance. Chairman, as a stakeholder, you ha I have to say that you have to be fair. Apart from the governing teams, the students are also very important. For example, students always say that they should be consulted on con tuition fees. So I hope that the consultancy report will take care of that aspect as well. Next, Mr. Michael Tan. Mr. Chairman, as far as I understand, for these self-financing institutions, why do they want to come under the government's regulation? It's because they would like to receive some benefits. That's a condition for their being regulated. For example, their programs would have to come under one single quality assurance regime. I'd like to ask, can any self-financing institution say no, that is, not to accept your regulation because it is not going to receive those benefits from you? If you say nobody can say no, then academically that's not in order. How can you force all these institutions to be regulated by you if you can force them then you don't need to provide benefits to them. So for the eight UGC-funded institutions, all along they're of the view that self-accreditation will suffice. They don't need to rely on you. They have land. They have everything. They don't have to rely on you. They will not release any powers to you. Then your whole proposal will fall through. 
I have been thinking of this. I just don't know what solutions you have. Secretary for Education, I'll say a few words, and then the Permanent Secretary will supplement. I'd like to reiterate that society has a lot of expectations for education, and in Hong Kong, we do have an education ordinance. Individual academic institutions find it essential to have recognition. It's also very important for students. Permanent Secretary, I think the Honourable Member has hit the nail on his head. We rely on policy regulation and concessionary or beneficiary benef benefiting offers. And such institutions have to be regulated if they receive benefits. In CAP 320 as well as CAP 320A, the subsidiary legislation, a lot have been stipulated, including the provision of a dean. Well, problems may arise every now and then. To answer Mr. Michael Tan's question, where are the benefits? Say if they want to obtain land resources at a nominal premium, they'd like to have their own campus. Well, what about the unified quality assurance system? If they reject the offer of benefits from you, what will happen? Will the eight UGC-funded institutions need these concessions? Well, some self-financing institutions may refuse your benefits. Well, just now, Dr. Helena Wong asked a similar question. We had no time to answer it. In 2010, a consultancy report was released for the setting up of a quality assurance body. By the third and fourth quarters of last year, the quadripartite committee in paragraph 7A was set up. Well, but for the self-financing institutions, if they refuse your offer of benefits, what will happen? But they are now willing to sit down and talk. We have the matching grant, and the self-financing institutions have to apply for land resources, just like the eight UGC-funded institutions. So they have to be willing to receive regulation. Mr. Leung Yu Chung, I'm pleased to hear the Secretary for Education say that education is different. There are social expectations. I was pre previously worried that you would say that education is just like a commodity. Well, even for a commodity, the Consumer Council will take care of consumers' interests. For the students of the self-financing institutions, who is safeguarding their interests? Your paper sounds good. You say quality assurance is to keep standard, ensure accountability, and to allow institutions to scale new heights. That's very important. How are you going to have assurance for all these? Now, quality assurance for the programs run by the self-financing institutions. As our colleagues and Mr. Michael Tan asked, how are you going to have quality assurance. All right, you have this quadripartite group. Well, the four parties are willing to sit down and talk, but what if they refuse to co collaborate? So what sort of regulation will ensure that you can attain your goals? So I have two questions, Chairman. Secretary, do you agree? that the quality of self-financing institutions are problematic at the moment. Can you give an open answer? What's your second question? My second question is, for the moment, are you going to sit back and watch only? If not, what effective measures will you adopt to solve the problems? Secretary? Just now, many representatives of various sectors told us uh, their actual experience. For example, Dr. Yun said that they had done a great deal of work to 
have quality assurance and to do justice to the students. They would like society to have a, a correct impression of their institution. Well, under the pretext of a mechanism, we may still have uh, problems with individual institutions. For example, individual institutions might have over enrollment of students. Still, we have stringent regulation. So earlier, a second report was released to tell the public how we're going to rectify the situation. So in future, the same may not recur. So if you ask me, I say we do have a mechanism, but that mechanism has to advance with time. Secondly, the work of the Education Bureau involves collaboration with various parties. As the Permanent Secretary said, we don't need to say anything before the TV, but then we'll work. For example, we'll find time to get the four parties together to discuss. So we have a concerted effort. We don't need confrontation. He has not answered my question. He said that he would do justice to the students. But at the same time, he mentioned that there were individual incidents. So would you please give us the full picture? Secondly, you said that all the stakeholders would sit down and talk. But what will they do? Permanent Secretary, I'd like to tell Mr. Leung, before a single quality assurance body was is set up, uh, we can still do quality assurance. The HKCA AVQ is actually the gatekeeper at the moment. Paragraph 7 to 12 of the paper say that uh, we've adopted a multi-pronged approach to reach the same goal. We have a regime for the publicly funded institutions. We have another approach for the self-financing institutions. But all these approaches will reach the same goal. Abraham Sheikh, Leung, Kwok Hong, and Fernando Chang. Abraham Sheikh, please. Thank you for coming to uh, tell us that the CAP 320 is updated. Secretary. What about UGC? Is UGC outdated as well? There are many universities under uh, the UGC. Is the quality control the same for all? Uh, what, what, what do you mean by quality? Th there's a question of how you define it. These institutions are not there to make profits. They have uh, visions and uh, missions. If you want to have a single body to the Look at quality. Then, then, what what do you mean by good, and what do you mean by not so good quality? Even the the eight institutions are not the same in in terms of uh, quality. So, how do you measure quality? It's a changing definition. Even for the UGC funded universities, you you still want to have a, a diversity. Too much control uh, is not going to be good for the academic autonomy. And how can you make sure that different needs are met? And you want to regulate uh, uh, their operations. You, you have to provide the funding. And uh, how do you handle uh, the impact on uh, autonomy? Maybe uh, we should get an answer from the permanent secretary. Thank you, Mr. Shang. UGC has to move ahead with the times. There's also a quality assurance council under the UGC. They have done one a round of uh, work, and uh, in the second round, they would look at how uh, the self -govern governance of uh, institutions can be uh, enhanced. Well, of course, the UGC is aware that uh, the institutions funded by it are not identical. And uh, the UGC has also commissioned an international uh, consultancy study. Uh, under that study, the good practices of uh, famous international, uh, famous uh, educational institutions will be looked into to provide reference. 
Uh, answer uh, two, two of your points, uh, Mr. Sheik. Uh, first, is the UGC outdated? I think I have a conflict of interest. Um, but I, I don't believe it is. I believe it responds uh, flexibly to the needs of our eight institutions. Um, if I could turn to the single quality assurance body, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse a single quality assurance body with a single quality assurance system. They're quite different things. What a, a single quality assurance body would have to do is meet the needs of different types of institution, different scales of maturity. Um, our universities are in a very good position, it seems to me, to be able to regulate themselves. They've had um, self-accreditation uh, self powers for many years, some for over 100 years now, one for over 100 years. That has to be dealt with alongside an emerging young institution that's just about to receive um, self-accrediting powers. Those are quite distinct and extreme cases that have to be managed inside by one single uh, quality assurance body, but um, uh, operationally um, in a coherent manner. That's one reason why it's taking, uh, it, it isn't easy to put together the whole, the whole system. I think uh, one single quality assurance body is one thing, but a coherent uh, uh, system is, is another. That's quite a complex, uh, complex uh, thing to arrange. Okay, thank you for your response. Oh, Hako. Next, we have Mr. Leung Kwok Hong. Chairman, uh, on uh, legislative amendments, uh, it fell through a year ago. Uh, did you uh, look into the reasons, Secretary? According to Article 62 of Bracket 4 or 5 of the Basic Law, you, can, you are the one who can present bills. We can't do it. And if you don't present the bill, that uh, is required, you, you have failed to discharge your duties. So what have you learned from the experience? Why did it fail last time? Mr. Michael Tin asked uh, how you can uh, provide some check and balance. Well, but our tertiary sector starts since the uh, era of Mr. C.H. Tone uh, has been about qual quantity, not quality. Uh, now C Mr. C. H. Stone has stepped down, and uh, his fan, uh, Mr. C. Y. Leung, is the CE now. If you want to keep keep up with the quality re quantity requirement, and now the institutions may just say no. If you want to do something about quality, they just they can just say no. So if you want quantity, you must allow them to do what, whatever they want to do. You don't have a leverage. And that's the problem. You, you require something of them, and you have no choice. You have this uh, quadro party uh, joint committee, UGC Education Bureau, the HKCAAVQ, and the institutions. UGC is under your bureau. You are the education bureau, and the institutions uh, are united. Uh, and the HKCA VQ is also under you. So it's just two parties. We must deal with uh, the UGCs first. The UGC first. If it's not doing its job, what can you do? If the Hong Kong CAA VQ is not able to do its job, what can you do? There are many complaints. High tuition fees, violation of their own uh, constitutions, and so on, so forth. As I've said, you have all these uh, in insiders sitting together. So... Mr. Secretary, who is the, the uh, who is the uh, the leading party here? Who takes the lead? Well, UGC is just your puppet. Are you going to exercise your public uh, your power public power to see things done, Secretary? Well, one thing is important here. On the 3rd January, uh, 13th of January last year, we came here 
different views were expressed. After that, we didn't stop. We continue to work on uh, various fronts. And as the permanent secretary has uh, told you, we have made a certain progress in uh, consensus building. Uh, we want to prioritize things. Uh, we will try to eliminate uh, the particularly dated uh, provisions in the law. And uh, we would uh, take a step at a time and we'll move, move on, that's for sure. We have exchanged views for everyone here, and we understand that the sector uh, is doing fine, and we should uh, be more willing to listen to them. Uh, Dr. Fernando Zhang, uh, sorry, uh, I had to rush back uh, from uh, Polytechnic University, uh, and I have to declare my interest as a teacher of uh, PolyU. I'd like to thank all the uh, representatives from uh, tertiary institutions uh, who have come to share their insight with us. It's a question of uh, how we position our uh, tertiary education. Is it a kind of commodity, or do we want to make it as uh, accessible as possible to our young people so everyone has a fair chance to receive uh, education in the tertiary sector? If Hong Kong wants to become a knowledge-based economy, then in my view, we should do whatever it takes to help our young people as long as they are willing and capable to receive tertiary education. But it's in terms of a subsidized uh, university places, we've seen no change for 20 years. The government is is insistent that it should be uh, 14,500 places, and now it's just uh, 15,000. And now we have we, we see a, a little bit more in terms of uh, articulation places. For those who are qualified, who have uh, uh, got uh, grades that uh, would be eligible, and still 16,000 of them annually, do not get admitted because the government insists that uh, that's the number of uh, uh, sub subvented places or funded, publicly funded places that we like. And even after SARS, uh, you uh, encourage uh, institutions to offer more self-financing programs. Although we are not uh, in a position to print money, you encourage institutions to print diplomas. Many institutions uh, have got very rich. Their self-financing programs uh, now have a much higher capacity than their uh, normal undergraduate uh, programs. This is not just not normal. Do we want to leave things to the market so that uh, people who have the means got um, uh, get admitted? And if you don't have the, the money, you can uh, take a loan. It's an okay for institutions to over-enroll students. It's okay to have... Uh, uh, the uh, lecture rooms on top of uh, a billet parlor or on top of a, a market building. Uh, I think this is disastrous. It's, it's a it's a scandal. You are cheating our young people. Of course, uh, as t a teacher in in the tertiary sector. I'm one of those who benefit from the, this uh, expansion. The government doesn't really want to the, interfere with the market. Uh, they, in their mind, they espouse uh, elitism. They don't really care about what would happen to these uh, associate degree uh, holders, because uh, many of them will take a big detour and uh, rejoin the mainstream uh, system. Uh, some of them. Uh, may be able to uh, become the proper graduates. Oh, I don't really need answers, Chairman. It's not important. They have, uh, they have done it all wrong in terms of positioning of our education, uh, tertiary education. It seems that they regard this as a business, and I just don't see any way out unless the government changes mindset. All right, so me all members have spoken. Uh, Mr. Shad, do you want to declare your interest or want to clarify your uh, 
remarks. Well, I'm a, a council member of Hong Kong U and a court member of uh, Hong Kong UST. Thank you, uh, deputations and uh, individuals who have come to speak to us. If you want to make further submissions, you're welcome to do it in writing. And you may also wish to uh, leave us with your speaking notes. Um, Dr. Yip, I hope you can give us a, uh, your speech in writing because uh, Ms. Starry Lee uh, asked you a question and you didn't have sufficient time to respond. So uh, just jot down the name and your and the organization you represent on the notes uh, and leave your notes with us. Well, we were talking about uh, four parties or quadripartite uh, joint com committee. There were there are not going to be four parties. We have 26, uh, 28 uh, institutions, but there are 12. There are only 14 members on that committee, so the, the remaining 12 will be represented by some other institutions. All right, uh, I conclude uh, the discussion on this item. Uh, Permanent Secretary, you have one minute. I think uh, when we talk about the four parties, the Quadripartite Committee, we were uh, talking about the, cell, the quality assurance of self-financing programs offered by UGC-funded institutions. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Secretary, Permanent Secretary, and your, your colleagues. The next item, we move on to the next item. Uh, measures to address issues arising from the drop in secondary steel population. Uh, Deputy Secretary, I hope you can chair this part of the meeting because I have to uh, go over to the other room for which is uh, on the uh, CI panel. Will those members who would like to speak raise their hands? Michael Tian? All right. As the officials have already been seated, let's start. Once again, hands up, please. Those who would like to speak, those colleagues who would like to speak, Michael Tian, Elizabeth Quad, Kenneth Chan. Three for the moment. Then we have uh, ample time for discussion. So five minutes each. Before members speak, I'd like to invite the officials to brief us on the administration's paper. Mr. Young, Under Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. According to population forecast, in the next few years. S1 student population will continue to decline. We forecast that by 2017-18 and the following years, the student population will gradually rise again. In the past, the administration and the education sector discussed this seriously. After balancing the aspirations and concerns of parents and students. Last year, we launched three initiatives in the hope that in the interim, we'll be able to support the schools and school capacity. There's no policy on the part of the government to close schools. Given the limit of three classes, any school which operates only two classes can continue to operate. Those operating one class can submit plans to us to ensure that at the senior secondary level, broad and balanced curricula can be provided. One class and two class schools can participate in the secondary school place allocation system to avoid the stigmatization effect and 
to safeguard students' opportunities to further their studies. As the student population declines, it is unavoidable to reduce the number of secondary one classes. From For the three years up to 2015-16, those with excessive teachers can keep uh, excessive or surplus teachers for three years that will benefit education in the long run. In the 2013-14, we launched the three initiatives, particularly school-based initiatives to implement a gradual reduction of S1 classes. We eventually reduced 12 S1 classes only, far lower than previously expected. So the three-pronged approach proved to be successful. It's a three-year plan such that in the transitional period, schools can still stably develop in order to avoid reviews year after year. So will, in accordance with this plan and in accordance with consensus among schools, adopt the three-pronged approach. We'll spend no effort in supporting the development of schools and the education sector. Once again, in this year's project, the expenses on education will be the greatest, $61.7 billion, an increase of $3.3 billion, taking up a fifth of the government's expenditure. By in 2013-14, the tuition fee stood at $54,170, and that would be increased to $59,960, an increase of 10%. There will be close liaison among schools in the same district such that the three-pronged approach could be as effective as possible. So I'll stop here for the moment and take views from members. Let me ask again, Michael Tan, Elizabeth Quad, Kenneth Chan and Starry Lee have signed up for speaking. And I will also speak. Altogether five members, five minutes each. Mr. Chung Kwok Chi would also like to speak. I'd like to remind members that uh, I have submitted a motion, so I reserve some time for discussing that motion. Mr. Michael Tan, Mr. Chairman, for the reduction of S1 classes, I've heard from parents, the government, and the education sector. So to put it in simple terms, a reduction in placement is a dispute between parents and schools. So it's a struggle between parents and schools. Well, what can the government do? It cannot please both parties. Well, for schools, they're worried about school closure if they have too few classes, and some famous schools are worried that the band three schools will have less students, then more will, and more will take on band two students, and then the famous schools will have to take on band two students as well. For parents, they res disregard everything. What they want is that the children can enter the renowned schools. From the standpoint of parents, it is the natural duty of schools to take account of discrepancies in learning capabilities. As a renowned school, it should be able to take on students with lower learning abilities. That's the standpoint of parents. What is the standpoint of the schools, the renowned schools? Well, some schools may become schools using Chinese as the medium of instruction. Now, they don't want to become such schools, so they try to reduce the discrepancies among students. So both teachers and students encounter difficulties. As for school allocation, Previously, they got a reduction of 5,200 secondary places. Many renowned schools got less students as well. For those students 
getting the first three wishes. There are about 93% of them, or over 90% of such students got one of their first three wishes. So people say they don't need to worry. So why not 211? Why not 221? So all parties have their respective justifications. Well, the government would like to strike a balance. As there's a reduced placement, I'd like to know whether the government has been doing enough to cope with the drop in student population such that no schools will have to be closed and the renowned schools don't need to worry as well. So how or in what way can you ensure that the 2-1-1 formula will be the best balanced formula? Mr. Yao, from Mr. Tan's remarks, I can see that he had spent a great deal of time to understand the issue. Well, previously we did not have the so-called 211 option or 221 option. We actually lowered the threshold for the number of S1 classes such that surplus students could remain in their respective schools to do research or other types of work that would help maintain the capabilities of schools and capabilities of teachers. We'd like to avoid school closure. We understand that the whole education sector is very concerned about the learning environment and ecology of schools. So we had a very frank and sincere discussion among all stakeholders in order to address this student population decline problem. The solution was a three-year solution. That is a 2-1-1 scheme or a 2 2 one scheme. Well, if after the first year of reduction the result is very poor, there are a lot of unforeseeable factors and our projections are inaccurate, then we'll reconsider the formula. Last year, we came out to say that there was only a reduction of 12 classes, far better than expected. 21111 was the final formula we agreed with the schools and were confident that we can attain that. Next, Dr. Elizabeth Quatt. I don't understand one point. Last year, we had 3,500 surplus places. And for this year, the Bureau expects 4,500. Well, last year, 3,500 with the minus two formula. If this year is really 4,500, then why it is not two, two, but only one for this year? And you still don't have uh, any problem. Last year, was it 3,500, Mr. Yeo? All along, we've been saying that in the coming few years, the student population will drop, and then in 2017-18, it will rise again. As for statistics, in the past, we already had a few rounds of discussions. We tried to explain that the number of classes does not just depend on the calculation of places and students. Parents, choices, coordination among schools and students will also matter. That is, there may be a transfer of students from one school to another. So it's not a simple addition or subtraction. You cannot just purely say last year you had this number, this year we have this number. We shouldn't view the situation like this. Last year, we had a discussion with the education sector and arrived at a three-year solution. And that proved to be effective last year. For this year, we can see that the solution will still be effective. As I said, parents' choices matter. 
So we need to wait for the ultimate outcome before we can actually assess the solution. But in our hearts, our feeling is that we might not be able to just reduce 12 classes as in last year. With such a decline in student population, we may not be able to keep that figure. Mr. Chairman, I don't see the logic. He said that according to his feeling, this year they might not be able to keep the figure, but he has not answered my question. Mr. Young, can you explain the figures and was your forecast accurate and what if the situation deteriorates this year? How will you handle the situation? Jesse, oh, Deputy Secretary. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll say something about figures. For surplus places, S1 population is to drop. In 2013-14, we forecast a drop of 5,000 odd and 3,000 odd will remain. 2014-15, a drop of about 2,800. Because of the 211 formula, another place will be reduced. And then in 2014-15, there will be 4,500 surplus places. Maybe Dr. Quad was a bit confused. How is that related to the reduction of the number of classes? As Mr. Young said, we had a threshold for starting classes. For this year, it's 32. But there's another threshold of 25. That is, if you have 26 students, you can open a class. Well, there's a difference between 4,500 and 3,500, but it is not a simple division for assessing that there will be a lot of classes. Will the student population further drops from 5,000 to 2,500? If so, we'll have to reduce more classes. As I said, you don't need to fill the whole class before you can set up a class. So we don't yet know how many classes we can have. So. Why 211? Why not 2? The mitigation measure is not just to reduce. This is a three-pronged approach. As the re a result of class reduction, the surplus teachers will be retained for three years. Schools are worried that the number of teachers might also decline. So this is a mitigation measure. It's not just one approach. It's not just reduction. It's not just class reduction in number. So it's 211, 111, and so forth. And then we have to look at the threshold for setting up a class and also the retention of teachers, no school closure, etc., etc. Dr. Kenneth Chen, last week we met some uh, schools and their principals. They uh, said they were frustrated because they kept on uh, meeting the bureaus of uh, bureaus officials they uh, keep kept on asking for the same thing and uh, according to the under secretary it was done last year it would be for 3 years unless there are special reasons uh, we are not going to change it now it's not a question of uh, doing the calculation if we can't the numbers, a few thousand here, a few thousand there. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I hope uh, the officials wouldn't would mind my saying this. We're talking about education. It's an important uh, question about uh, ideals. And we must also uh, continue to upgrade quality of education. You talk about the, uh, the relief measures for schools. Well, it's an opportunity, just like what we said when we wanted small class teaching, which has changed the crisis into an opportunity to improve quality of education. And don't just tell the young teachers that you are not going to be uh, make a redundant, but we have to first of all clarify what is it, what is education for. If just count the numbers. And you seem to say that uh, this is the perfect solution that you will come up and you don't need to listen to them. Well, if there is uh, accepted, uh, there's no need for them to to approach you to discuss uh, different things uh, time and again. Of course, 
parents have uh, certain expectations and aspirations. I can understand that. And uh, according to the principle, some 80% of students are got uh, uh, admitted to schools of their choice. And you cannot say that uh, I'm, uh, we are uh, weary of uh, parents' uh, reaction and uh, so sorry, school principals, I can't do it. I don't think that you are just an, uh, an uh, middleman trying to the side with one, one party to the fight the other. Well, actually, uh, teachers have, and schools have a vision. They have certain ideals and principles to uphold. Do you understand why they have to uh, talk to you for so many times, Under Secretary? Are you talking about uh, education to them or about money, actually? Uh, not counting my colleagues. I have uh, talked to principals in the so-called uh, hard-hit uh, districts, not just once, but many, many times. I respect uh, these uh, schools school principals. They are well-respected uh, educationalists. I don't think they are trying to just safeguard their own interests or to uh, uh, save safeguard their esteemed or reputation or jobs for their teachers. They do have uh, certain worries, but uh, I think we should bear in mind the background to the whole issue. We are now uh, trying to deal with uh, something ari arising from a short-term population decline. Should we take the opportunity to implement small class teaching? We have said this uh, time and again. We should not say that uh, we should go for small class teaching just because of uh, a declining student population. I've heard remarks that the uh, EMI or, or the language uh, medium of instruction policy will be affected by the declining student population. I think uh, the medium of instruction policy should be uh, assessed and adjusted in a professional manner. We are discussing things with uh, principals uh, on the professional level. Of course, uh, they would uh, give us some data in the discussion, and we would do the same uh, by referring to data. There are many stakeholders in the education system, and we have to take care of the different needs of different parties. Um, if I may uh, just wrap up very quickly, Chairman. Uh, when uh, the satisfaction rate of uh, school allocation is very high, well, the parents uh, did make uh, some adjustments because they were aware of the reduction in uh, allocation. If we did not do what we did, uh, the uh, success rate would be different. I'm not happy with the reply. I'm I'm inclined to the to uh, believe in what the principals told me, Mr. Starry. Well, I agree with. Uh, Mr. Michael Tin's assessment. This is an issue that uh, impinges on many stakeholders. I can understand the stance of uh, the schools and the bureau, but from the perspective of uh, parents, uh, the most the, the, the concern is whether uh, the chances of uh, my children's admission to the good schools be uh, reduced. I think we should uh, look at different districts. Last year, I asked the same question. No school was closed last year because of reduction in enrollment. It was the answer given last year. Can you confirm this now? And how many schools can uh, have uh, can only uh, operate two S1 classes this year? And if there's only one class in S1, they will have to apply to the bureau and uh, come up with some development strategy before development plan before they are allowed to continue its operation. Although the medium of in, uh, instruction is a professional matter, 
But why are parents so choosy, so concerned about choosing the right school? They want to admit their children to EMI schools or school with more classes with EMI. If you don't involve them interactively, you cannot solve the problem. Have you carried out any study into this subject? If we reduce the uh, allocation on a district by district basis, would there be any uh, real effect on the number of EMI classes? Uh, Miss Lee is correct. We are dealing here the interests of uh, various parties, various stakeholders. I fully understand the uh, views of school principals in those districts which are uh, more heavily impacted on. Some are talking about a reduction of three or four this year and next year. When you tell parents that in a certain district, uh, there will be a reduction of three or four students per class, and uh, there are chances of uh, getting admitted to schools of their choice will be reduced. And some parents will offer places in other districts through the uh, general system. It is difficult to uh, analyze and assess how parents will react. So the end result might or might not be what the principals uh, have expected. No school closure last year. And we have for 13, 20, 13, 20, 14, we have uh, seven schools offering only two S1 classes. What about those offering only one S S1 class? There was no school uh, requiring a special permission to continue to operate. We have uh, met with a representative from uh, the Council of EMI Schools. Well, we, even EMI schools recognize that we should look at the ability of uh, students and teachers and whether there are sufficient uh, supporting measures uh, adopted by the school in deciding the proper medium of instruction. We'll continue to have discussion with them. Anything else from the Deputy Secretary? No. Uh, for the first round, we have Mr. Peter Chung, Dr. Helena Wong, and Mr. Lam Tai Fei. And then uh, for the second round, Mr. Elizabeth Quart and uh, Mr. Tommy Jung as well. And very importantly, we must have Mr. Tommy Jung. Peter Chung, Deputy Chairman, Helena Wong, uh, Lam Tai Fai, Tommy Jung, Helena Wong. We cannot uh, wrap up by five, half past five. We let's extend the meeting by 15 minutes. Mr. Peter Chung. Well, this is a uh, complicated. Uh, so we have this uh, two one 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 uh, approaches. Uh, I met uh, with some school principals uh, a few days ago. Your relief measures cannot uh, retain the teaching post. You can only uh, retain the teachers. In uh, in uh, in one school. The music teacher left, but the school uh, is not allowed to recruit another music teacher, so the teaching post is gone. Last year, there was a loss of 12 classes, but you don't know what the, what uh, the situation will be like this year because uh, there are many variables. But anyway, you must come up with uh, projections. So let's say if we adopt 211, if it's 2, then there is a uh, 12 classes. If it's a 3,000 plus and now it's 4,000 plus, then I would say it's at least a loss of 30 classes. If you say that I don't know, you should not overestimate the number lost. If there are over 30 classes lost, what would you do? And you, are no, you don't have uh, school closure this year. What about a few years down the road? Because the uh, relief is for three years. 
if they have got uh, fewer students, fewer classes, sooner or later the school has to be closed. It's just a delayed process. And the sc schools in band three are most vulnerable, but band three schools are very important. Are you saying that we are not going to have band three students? Band three students will be admitted to band two schools and band two students to band one schools. The parents will be happy, but not the students. Are we going to uh, have no band three schools whatsoever? I think we should increase manpower for band three schools at this moment to in order to better help band three students. In the past, uh, it's, a ju it's a tight fit situation. You can't do it. And now with more redundant teachers, you, you are able to uh, improve band three schools. Uh, there will be population increase in uh, 2018, 2019, and there will be uh, uh, children to no mainland parents who will be admitted to our schools. What will happen? Are you going to build new schools and uh, recruit teachers then? Young teachers uh, is subject to the last in first out uh, approach. Where if a school is uh, could be closed, and that is to say, the experienced teachers would uh, be more likely to be retained. What about succession plan? Lastly, is uh, parental choice the only choice we? Uh, we pay attention to our parents are good uh, choosers. Can we move the threshold down a little bit? Some people have said that this is a, a, a revenue saving exercise. How much can you save? What can you do with uh, the revenue so saved? Well, we are talking about a short-term population decline. We need the schools in the future. We need the students, the teachers in the future. That's why we want to have this a three-prong approach to preserve the the schools and the teachers. If the decline is long-term, uh, our approach will be different. We have said time again that there's no call, there's no so-called school closure policy because of the expected. Rebound in population, so there's no question of uh, the need to build new schools and recruit more teachers uh, some years down the road. Uh, on, on, Is 30 classes too much or too few? I won't give a definitive answer here because I really don't know what will happen in future if we have a reduction of 30 classes. Anyway, we have to handle the situation. We'll discuss with the education sector. As for band three schools, or rather schools taking on more band three students, they're usually the less popular schools and schools taking on less students. 26 per class, so then they can have two classes. If there's a further reduction with a couple more teachers, they will have sufficient manpower to take care of learning discrepancies. Mr. Ip Yun, Mr. Chairman, the Secretary for Education and the Permanent Secretary have not stayed on for this discussion. Is regrettable because this is a concern in the education sector at the moment. I believe all those members present here share my feeling. The education sector has discussed this many, many times. The severity of the problem is clear. Just now, the Bureau gave us some figures. Seven schools only got two S1 classes. In the past, these schools would have been closed. Why were they not closed? It's only because the school closure threshold had been lowered artificially. Twelve classes is not a small cl is not a small figure. Seven schools got only two S1 classes. As a result, many schools encounter difficulties to continue to operate. If there's a further 
decline. Say, just like what Mr. Chong Kwok Chi said, for this year there's a reduction of 30 classes, then there will be an even more serious imbalance. It's not just a problem facing teachers and parents. It's a problem for the whole society. In the past few years, in primary schools, we had school closure incidents and reduction of number of classes. Privately, I also discussed this problem with the education officials. Are we going to repeat the same mistake? There are aftermaths for the primary schools. Immediately now, secondary schools are in difficulty. Number two, as Chang Kwok Chi said, no new teachers can be recruited. We now worry that uh, there will be an aging problem among secondary teachers. And then a few years on, we won't have uh, new teachers for succession. A new teacher may be employed for just one contract uh, and he has to leave. We cannot nurture new blood. There will be a weakening of the teaching team. Your relief measures seem to have addressed the problems. But uh, we have a serious problem with new teachers, which will affect the next generation and the next next generation. You cannot evade the issue. The surplus places will grow in number, but the number of students, S1 students, will decline. The problem will grow, but the effort in tackling the problems diminishes. So we're waiting for luck to solve the problem. Do you agree? If that is the case, we are doomed to failure. We've been planning for our education for so many years. I believe we can consolidate the complicated factors. Therefore, this problem has to be clearly described and defined. Is the government willing to reduce the number of S1 students allocated to each school? We must discuss this today. Mr. Yeah. I said this twice. The Secretary for Education also mentioned this previously. We don't have a school closure policy. The number of classes may drop, but that doesn't necessarily result in school closure. Therefore, these three relief measures were adopted because we understand the severity of the problem. Last year, we spent a great deal of time with the education sector to work out these approaches. This is a concern for the education sector and for the whole society. We agree. We are fully dedicated to an explanation to the education sector. As for figures, always we have different calculations from different people. We do understand the factors involved. It's just that it's difficult for us to forecast how many more classes will be reduced this year. Dr. Helena Wong and then Mr. Tommy Chung. Mr. Chairman, I have to declare that I'm a PTA member as well as the Honorary Secretary of a PTA Association. Now, I have this paper from the PTA. Sorry, PTU. We are so angry with this three-pronged approach, that is the relief measures. These school principals are also very dissatisfied. According to the PTU paper, the school principals have come to the LegCo to protest to the government and put forth their recommendations. They want 221, but you gave them 211 and 111. 80% of the school principals were of the view that the 
government's solution won't be able to address the student enrollment problem at the district level. From 2013 to 2016, altogether, the S1 population will drop by 10,800 students, three years in total. According to the opinion of the school principals and this PTU paper, they're of the view that the government approaches won't be able to solve the problem. Their suggestion is simple. For the SSPA committee, can it take care of the wishes of the schools and reduce the number of students allocated to each school? You have to reduce more such students. Twin Moon, Eastern, Shatin have a lot of problems. They have so many surplus places. Well, Under Secretary, originally this is not your mistake. The government has not done demographic planning well. And then we have these so-called SARS babies. And then the children born of non-local parents will also grow up. So, Under Secretary, can you be more thorough in your effort? Can you reduce the number of students further. They want less students. The three relief measures were unable to address their problems. You have to take care of the parents' wishes, but of course, all parents want their children to enter Band 1 schools. But it may not be a good thing for a child to enter Band 1 school. In the animals sector, the fittest will survive is the principle, but that is not applicable to the human world. Some students have learning difficulties. They may have difficulties in languages and so forth. If you do not reduce, further reduce the number of S1 students, then the Band 3 schools will encounter more serious problems, including those in Tumun and Sha Tin. If you close all Band 3 schools, is it a good thing? If all students go to Band 2 schools, is it a good thing? No, because you'll be creating more students who fail. These students will fail in EMI schools, and they will continue to encounter difficulties and frustration. Under Secretary, I think the Honourable Member has assumed that we'll close schools. But I've repeatedly said that we will not close schools. We can see that in future the student population will grow again. So we will not close schools. We'll not close a school just because it is a band three school. I really have nothing more to supplement. As for the so-called district-based solution, we cannot just allow schools in a particular district to choose their own students. We did read the PTU proposal. As for the figures put forth by them, as I said, there are different interpretations about figures. Last year, they had their own interpretation of the figures, but eventually the reality was not totally the same as what they forecast. So we have to study the impact on all stakeholders. We have to balance the interests of all parties concerned before we can work out a good solution. Mr. Tommy Chung and then Dr. Lam Tai Fai. Thank you, Chairman. On such an issue, I understand that the Education Bureau does not have uh, too many friends here in the LegCo. I won't be your friend either. I won't speak in support of you either. Well, the student population is to decline. We said that we want small class teaching. And now you only came up with 211 and 111. Well, to me, these are only measures to retain the jobs for teachers. Some of our colleagues commented on possible layoff, laying off of teachers. 
Sometimes, if the government overreacted, there may be problems. You see, these days we are always talking about popularism. The government always tries to stand on the side of the majority of the population. All right, if you try to please the majority, if suddenly one day because of our demographic policy, parents suddenly choose to raise one or two more children, then you have problems. As for teachers' jobs, we are now reducing the class size to twenty odd students per class. But if the student population rises again. The class size may have to be increased again to say thirty odd or forty odd students per class. I think you'd rather send the teachers to retraining so that they learn more about teaching and learning. Then, when the student population grows again, it would be better. Then schools don't have to be closed. You don't have. To reduce the number of S1 classes for the sake of reducing S1 classes, we'll send the teachers to retraining either overseas or on the mainland. In the past,、uh, teachers were overworked; they had to oversee everything, including administration. So now. Can you provide them with more training? Just now, our colleagues mentioned possible closure of band three schools. In fact, some band three schools performed very well. Well, some of their secondary six students performed very well because their teachers were performing very well. We appreciate these schools more than the renowned schools. The renowned schools are arrogant. Because of their names, well, in the past, these schools enrolled very few students, so it's easy for them to fetch high standard students. Well, some of our colleagues want to protect the jobs of the teachers. Let me say something to them. I am from a school sponsor of a DSS school. Now you are very harsh on such schools; they can't even get one more S1 student. But then, are you telling me to dismiss some S4 teachers, given so many students leaving at S5 and S6 levels? All right, you want to retain the teachers' jobs, then enroll more S1 students. You. Just put a cap to the total number of students in a school. It's easier to enroll S two students, S three students, or even S four students. You see, the parents are sending their children overseas to show their non-confidence in you. I have a relative. Who sent his child to overseas schools for a couple of years, and now the child came back to Hong Kong U to study medicine. And now the schools cannot admit students, although the parents、uh, have such a wish. Under secretary, any supplement? I think、uh, there are many.、Uh, Suggestions that are worthy of further consideration. We are not going to relax the、uh, enrollment criteria for admission of S1 students by DSS because of the declining student population. If we allow DSS to take on more students, the、uh, situation will just deteriorate. So it's expected by the government that the、uh, secondary student population will decline. You have stress again and again. This is a temporary phenomenon, but we are talking about a period of six or seven years. We are going to see a decline in 2013-14. You launched the、uh, three-pronged relief measures to preserve、uh, schools, teachers, and、uh, capacity. I've heard、uh, different views from the、uh, sector. Understand the bureau 
has stressed again and again, time and again. There's no so-called scrupulous policy. There's no intention to have one. But because of declining uh, secondary school, a secondary student policy, these schools would uh, would die a natural death. They would starve to death. Although you don't have any so-called school closure policy, you promised that in the coming three years, no schools will be uh, made redundant. But uh, some teachers think that this affects um, their morale. Some would uh, take uh, take other jobs, and some would uh, refrain from uh, joining the teaching profession. Many teachers are keen uh, professional uh, people. They don't want to be part of a redundant uh, team. So this is not healthy. If uh, the student number is so small, then uh, there's only one class in each uh, level. So the school will have a very uh, weak capacity. Uh, one, when we need uh, more school places, can these schools uh, be reactivated uh, and uh, capacity enhanced? Why can't the administration come up with further measures to address the uh, impact on uh, vulnerable schools? For example, in the most vulnerable districts, can we have a district-based uh, program to reduce allocation of uh, S of students? You don't seem to in favor of this. Is it because of policy objection, or is it because of uh, face, and you are afraid that uh, it would affect your um, reputation? But even if we have a uh, district-based approach, it's going to be voluntary in nature. Are you saying that we can stick to the free prompt measures, and then we can uh, stick to it all the way up to uh, 2018, 2019? Uh, there was a surplus of 3,200 last year, and uh, we, are, we lost 12 classes. But the number is bigger this year and uh, the following years. So we expect uh, to reduce a higher number of classes, and uh, this, you said uh, it was estimated by some schools that there would be a, a loss of 100 classes, but that was because uh, the free prone approach uh, had not been launched yet. So it's unfair to uh, say that they had a wrong impression, a wrong projection. You have uh, different measures. Uh, Dedicated positions for the dedicated deployment. Is it really not possible as a matter of policy for you to uh, re rethink and uh, do something different? I know that most teachers in Hong Kong are keen educationalists, and they don't want to just uh, be. Um, May redundant and still uh, get paid. I think uh, we can allow them to uh, further their studies while they are. They have time. They have uh, the capacity. Against the background of population decline, we will continue to the. Communicate with schools. We are willing to consider various measures and uh, reduction in allocation numbers. Is what we are going to do, Dr. Fernando Zhang. We knew well in advance that uh, the student numbers would decline. Uh, the government has come up with these uh, three prongs uh, relief uh, measures, and there will be no school closure. But the number of classes would uh, continue to decline. The class size would continue to uh, reduce, and they would uh, retain or promise to retain teachers for three years. 
but there are still problems, and some schools will be forced to commit suicide, so to speak. We have a, a committee, uh, a subcommittee on uh, integrated education. We discuss the uh, needs of uh, students with special educational needs. It seems there's a so-called migration in the primary school. These are SEN students are distributed quite evenly, but in the, the secondary school there are three bands. SEN students are. Academically weak, and they will be uh, allocated places in the band three uh, schools. There's a concentration of ascend students. These students uh, require more support and, uh, and tuition uh, from uh, teachers. So now the secondary student population is declining. Some of these schools, uh, band three schools, are not uh, doing a bad job. Uh, they are not. Uh, they are not committed. They are not uh, uncommitted. So perhaps uh, we should, uh, perhaps uh, give a particular higher weighting for SEN students, and then we can have a more reasonable. The, uh, deployment of teachers, in order that they are more capable of uh, teaching SEN students and offering SEN students with a better environment. Maybe this should be one of the measures adopted. This measure cannot solve all the problems. Uh, the chairman has referred to other measures such as district-based uh, allocation reduction. Uh, either you give them a higher weighting or other measures that they can accept. Can you not do more for SEN students? Because some schools have uh, taken on more SEN students, and they are sincere about uh, providing better uh, support to SEN students. Maybe we should allow them a, a bigger room for the survival. Maybe they can uh, come up with something uh, special uh, in uh, teaching such students. Under secretary, I was also involved in the uh, committee on uh, integrated education. I fully understand that SCN students need uh, more care and uh, more support from school. Is required to to take care of them. I think someone did raise the proposal on increasing the weighting for SEN students. My colleagues uh, on other occasions heard about this. It was also mentioned in the committee on uh, integrated education. Oh, we did consider this. It's not. It was not considered uh, in the uh, light of uh, the need to reduce allocation. We look at it from the uh, perspective of the needs of SEN students. It's not totally impossible. It's being practiced in some jurisdictions, but it's very different from the current policy. We need more time to consider. Uh, administrative uh, measures, for example, uh, uh, the movements of uh, students, send students from uh, one to another, the uh, different degrees of um, disabilities of uh, send students. But uh, we do not think that uh, this is something we have to do uh, in order that we can handle problems associated with uh, declining student population. Two more would like to speak. We have uh, draw the line for the first round. <laughs> I would uh, just use the time allocated for the second round. Uh, sorry, uh, I have already drawn the line. But not the normal practice is that uh, you can have a shorter time given to members uh, speaking in the second round. 
Uh, we need to handle a motion as well. Uh, can we have uh, some elaboration from the, the clerk? Deputy Chairman would like me to explain the procedure. The uh, Deputy Chairman has a table a motion, but since uh, we have already exceeded the uh, allotted time, this meeting was supposed to end uh, at uh, half past five. According to 24A of uh, House Rules, if a motion is moved within the meeting time and uh, the motion has been agreed to be uh, handled, otherwise the motion cannot be handled in the extended uh, period. Uh, at uh, 5.30, it was not agreed by members that uh, the motion will be handled in the extended period, so this motion cannot be handled now. Oh, so we have three more members. Miss Elizabeth Quart, Dr. Henella Wong, and uh, Miss Priscilla Leung. Three minutes for Q's and A's. So I've heard uh, the questions raised by members and the answers given. I'm not convinced why the administration must uh, adopt this 211 uh, plan. What would happen if uh, the government insists? What What would happen if we do not uh, adhere to this uh, two one one plan? Would there be any uh, financial problems? I still cannot understand the logic of uh, the bureau's uh, insistence. There's no prediction. You you cannot predict what would happen in the future, but you want to preserve the schools, uh, the, the teachers, and uh, the school's capacity. If you don't know how many uh, classes would be lost, and if parents all go to, up to uh, enroll their children to Band 1 and Band 2 sc uh, schools, how can you make sure that a Band 3 schools will not be closed down? What are we discussing anyway? If we do not adopt for this year, the plan to reduce two, and if we just go for a reduction of one, what would happen? Yes, please. The clerk already said that we could no longer process this motion. Mr. Chairman, if you processed this before 5.45, it should be all right. No, before 5.30. Well, then that's your duty. Because you failed to process the motion before 5.30, you drew a line there. Well, let me finish, Mr. Chairman. You are trying to defeat the motion technically because the motion was not submitted only now. Well, Chang Kwok Chi, listen calmly to my explanation. There's a misunderstanding here. After completing the first round, I said that uh, I had to attend a CI panel meeting in room three. I handed the chairmanship to the deputy chairman for the second item on the agenda. Before that, I already knew that there was this motion, but when I returned, I did not know that he had not yet processed the motion. It's just a misunderstanding. I did not have any intention to defeat that motion technically. I'm also very concerned about that motion. I interviewed many deputations. My concern for the middle class is no less than yours. So there's a misunderstanding. Just now, why I did not explain that in the presence of the deputy chairman is because there's this misunderstanding. We can still process the motion at our April meeting. Well, don't think that uh, I have any particular intention. We just want to do our job well. The secretariat or oh, deputy chairman first. I can verify that Dr. Lam Tai Fai did not have that intention. 
but the procedures are problematic. The clerk explained that we had to agree before 5.30 p.m. to handle the motion during the extension. However, we needed a quorum. I think that's a misunderstanding because we might not need to have a quorum count. Within the extension time, a meeting was still valid. So, so long as we agreed to process the motion, it would be all right. You can see that before 5.30 p.m., I tried to make sure that we had a quorum. Eventually, we did not handle the motion. In fact, before 5.30 p.m., I WhatsApped Ip Kin Yun to make sure we had a quorum. At the beginning of the meeting, I thought that uh, you had already discussed this because I went to the CI panel meeting. Well, let me supplement. At the start of this agenda item, there was a switch in officials, etc. The Deputy Chairman, Mr. Ip, did say that he had tabled a motion, hoping that this meeting would have time to handle that. At that time, there were only a few members in the room, and we did not have a quorum then. If you look at uh, the rules of procedure, you see that uh, if you don't have a quorum and there's no clear decision, then we cannot consider the result of the voting as being valid. It's rather risky. All right, so there's no intention, no motive for a technical defeat of the motion. Dr. Elizabeth Kwa, do you need a response? Yes, just a res just a brief response. Well, we had a prolonged discussion. I'll extend the meeting until all speakers have spoken, including Dr. Helena Wong and Dr. Priscilla Leung. Number one, not all parents will choose Ben One schools. Parents have to consider a number of factors when they make a choice. Parents will choose different school banding after considering the need of their students. Given these three relief measures, the teachers can stay on th for three years. So overall speaking, schools won't be severely affected in terms of manpower level. How can you make sure that Ben 3 schools in certain so-called hard-hit districts wouldn't have to close? Well, brief answer, please. There's no way for us to work out a figure because each school is different. No matter what method you use, parents' choices may render a certain school under enrolled. Yes, that's natural elimination. Dr. Helena Wong, first of all, I hope that at the next meeting we can process Mr. Kenyon's motion. Just now when the Under Secretary answered my question, he said that there's no policy for school clo closure. There's no intention to close schools. But <laughs> will there be consequences that lead to school closure. Well, schools have to consider a number of factors before they have to consider whether they have to close. I don't think our three-pronged relief measures will lead to any school having to close down. I dare not tell you in the next three years, four years, or five years, all schools will remain. It really depends on the considerations of individual school sponsors. And there are other factors to consider as well. Well, if any school is to close, that has nothing to do with the Education Bureau. Is that what you are saying? Well, you are asking a hypothetical question. If a school is closed, we have to analyze the cause of closure. 
That means we cannot hold any party liable. Well, given our three-pronged relief measures, which are based on the concept of no school closure, well, but your concept may lead to schools closing. So, if that is to happen. Should we hold you liable? We have already warned you already, and you tell us that no school will close. What if some schools are to close? Should you be held liable? Well, we cannot guarantee that no school will close. Now we cannot be hundred percent sure. Well, that's my question. The schools may be staffed to death, Doctor Priscilla.、Lo. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ipkin Yun's motion is rather general, so don't worry. At the last term of the SARG, we already discussed school closure. The kindergarten in which I studied also closed because it is difficult to foresee whether or not the student population of a particular district will grow again. In Taipo, we. Have a very famous secondary school, which was very famous in meteorology. Closed down, or climatology also closed down. So you have to consider diversification. In future, a student population will grow again. So you have to find a solution so that parents and students won't panic. That's your job, not our job. What、well, I mentioned that very famous school,、uh, which was closed on Land Town. Well, you mention capabilities. Of students, but I'd rather look more into the personalities and behavior of students. Anyway, even if your pretext is not to close schools, you should not leave the schools to survive on their own to maintain one class or two S1 classes. You have to diversify the schools in order that schools will attract different types of students. And a secretary. We've heard her.、Uh, we're willing to discuss with the schools. Members, let me repeat: our next regular meeting will be held on the 14th of April, Monday, at 4:30 p.m. At the beginning of today's meeting, as we had, we have four items on the next agenda. I'd like to extend the next meeting to 7 p.m. to observe Kenneth. Chan's suggestion about fifteen years of free education, plus the motion that has not yet been handled, the one moved by Mr. Ip Kenyun. I may have to discuss with the secretariat, and our next regular meeting may extend beyond seven p.m. If it is to last till seven fifteen or whatnot, we'll inform you. So meeting adjourned. Thank you.